would like to begin this teaching with pulling and the blowing of the pool. So if you would like driving, please.
a lot of Kaku. I'm Ruth Kolome. Thank you for having me in your community. Um, today, um, I guess what brought us here was our um, my fight for my family's land. Not in the sense that the way you folks have been probably doing it. I learned more about my genealogy through this process. But um, what I was fighting for was the warranty deed that my husband and I paid for in cash in 1998 when we bought my sibling's interest out. And we didn't know anything about Juliana lands, uh, the, the king's private lands, the lodial titles, any of that. But as we, um, when I was putting in for a Juliana land tax exemption, that's when I learned that we didn't know our land. And that started my journey. And of course, my journey kind of started, it had to be a little bit before that when my daughter had to re-register for a family of schools. And they made us go deeper into our genealogy. And um, I didn't know how to do that. So I had hired a genealogist that um, found one of my great-grandfather's uh, uh, probates that had um, Mary Pukui, who was one of our relatives, that put in the genealogy. And when I saw it, I didn't recognize any of the names, couldn't even pronounce the names, since I grew up uh, on the continent. And um, so I was kind of ashamed that I couldn't even say the names of our family. But I learned more and more about who these people were and our genealogy unfolded, and as it unfolded, so did our rich history, so did my understanding of what went on with the Mahele, and how all of us actually are heirs <coughs> of land, whether we know it or not. Yeah. And the more I dug into it, the more I started recognizing the names, <coughs> a lot of people will say, well, we didn't get lands, but when I ask them their names, I've seen those names in the land documents. So I know, I, actually I don't know of anybody who hasn't seen um, that has land. I just, we have to, that some of us haven't begun the journey. So, there. Hmm. It was Auntie Don Watson that when she saw my genealogy, she says, I know you don't know who you are, and I'm not going to tell you. This is your journey, and as you take it, you will learn more about your history. When you start reading the books that have been written by our historians, you'll start to understand who you are and what your who God is. And um, it's been a very rich journey, and tonight we'll be able to share a little bit with you. So thank you for coming. Ano ay mikeloha in a bulo mano ni kaole. I greet you with a greeting taught to me by my kupuna. Her her name is Riyadi Aki. It's a old traditional greeting and yet it is modernized and it says greetings to you all birds of many feathers in the traditional style only certain of the were allowed to wear certain feathers but in the modern times in the respect that we give to an audience ye, ye birds of many feathers who have gathered together. So it's an honorific form of a traditional reading, somewhat modernized. And she says that with the power of the Hawaiian language, there is certain contents in the pronunciation and in the vowel sounds, that what it does is it creates in an audience the willingness to sit and listen to things that they may, ne may not have heard of previously, but to at least to create a sense of patience so that they will at least hear you. And I've gone to many places giving talks for the last 40 plus years, talking about why these Americans should be out of Hawaii. 
that they have no business coming into Hawaii and stealing our nation. They have gone before organizations of retired military personnel. And it's not something that is easy for them to hear, but I found that through such greetings and an explanation of what the greetings are, they will at least give you the time to express yourself. And so this too, I greet you in that form, to give us an opportunity to state what we believe, whether or not you like it or not, and to engage in a type of high-level discussions. What Andy Pilahi also told me that was that there are three levels of conversation in the Hawaiian language. One can be described by the word malelo. The other by the word The other by the word Valao, and the third by the word Uka Uka. He says, don't waste people's time. People want to get right down to important information, ideas, things that make you aspire. And so I hope that our discussion will get away from the discussion about merely talking about people or talking about people and events. Those are just gossips. But if we can talk about values, we can talk about dreams, we can talk about aspirations, and let us try to conduct our discussions for tonight at that deep level of Uka Uka, then I think the meeting, whether or not we agree or disagree, will have been successful. My name is Poka Rainui. I'm also known as Hayden Burgess, and we'll get into that further later because I've been told two minutes. Pow! And it goes. Okay, for the rest of the panelists, I mean, because we got to 9 o'clock, we need to be out there at night. A lot of information being shared. So, two minutes introduction. Hello, we all go. Okay. Thank you. My name is Kelly. My name is Ila Kira Kekumono. I'm a family from Maui. I'm here to share a lot of information. I have been a researcher since I retired from Transworld Airlines. I flew for them for 33 years. I came back to Hawaii because I was distraught um, when I was uh, lobbying with Leon Su and Ku Chang to get the Akafa bill. We actually, in 2006, were very successful in getting that defeated through the Heritage Foundation in Washington. And it actually happened. And in doing so, I studied under a federal judge there that became, a, he was a federal judge and then became a federal judge under the Obama administration. After learning truth, studying the Constitution, I had to come home because our people are totally unaware of what is going on. And so my whole purpose for the last seven years, I have dedicated my life to represent, write legal briefs, and go to court for our poor and disingenuous here in the Waianae Coast. And a lot of you know me, and a lot of you know that I've written a lot of legal briefs, and I've fought for you in the courts. So I'm just here to uh, give you lots of information, things that have been withheld from our people, because people don't have the means to go to Washington, study there, and find out the laws and how they apply to us. Uh, my name is Mahela Ikana Oi, and I am a um, Papakolea host. Yo. Born and raised, uh, been in the kingdom since 1974, when I first saw George Helm at the Yoan Palace, and I was wondering, what is he talking about? I thought we were a U.S. citizen. And I got all crazy, and after that point, from 1974 to today, 
continue to be in research. On April 16, 2008, I was recognized as a head of state by, on the 51st day of legislation in the state of Hawaii legislative body. And so was uh, my entire the government, and I do have the papers over here. And you know, I'm going to pass this on because we have so much to share, each one of us. Here you go. Hello. Uh, excuse me. Hello, my uh, I'm Dexter Um I'm an attorney by profession. Um, and I've been involved in the struggle, at least from a legal standpoint. First off, let me say, uh, I'm glad to be here in this beautiful country. Yeah. Uh, Mahalo for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. Um, so I, I guess I'm here to provide a different perspective, a legal perspective of what what I've been doing as well as how it coincides with the letter by Dr. Desires and maybe give some ideas about how he is uh, about to move forward and let those ideas as well. But I'll thank you for your fight. Sorry about the sound system, guys. I'm not sure it's going Okay, um, so we're going to go to our main presentation. It's going to be about 15 minutes per person. And the main objective of the evening is the focus is the UN Memorandum for Dr. Desaiz. Um, as neighborhood board members, we found out earlier this summer, and um, we kept getting brought to our attention every board meeting, you know, this is significant, this is from the High Commissioner's Office, and we felt like we needed it to be addressed. So, uh, for those of you who are just coming in now, the reason we're having this town hall is because the neighborhood board has decided it's, it's important to um, spread awareness about this, educate the community, and, and provide clarification for what this UN memorandum means. Um, if you don't have a copy of the letter, we, we do have some uh, copies I'll put on the back table so you can get familiar. Um, so uh, the main point, again, uh, for each of the speakers is, you know, what does this letter mean um, for our community? Um, any clarification, education, awareness um, can provide for all of us um, would, would be much appreciated. So, mahalo. Hello again. Um, so the, the way this letter came about was in uh, 2015 when um, I was dealing with the banks uh, and trying to get my property um, policy, title insurance policy invoked, I learned that um, I really wasn't going to get any help here. So in 2015, Leon Sue helped me get to the UN and I began um, getting introduced to a lot of people there. Well, initially when I went to the UN, within three hours, I asked them, I go, wait, how do you get anything done here? This is just politics. You know, it's more of the same. And so I was pretty disappointed at first. But then Leon started introducing me to the different people that he's been working with years and years. And what I learned was it's all about relationships. And so through Leon Sue, I was introduced to people like um, Dr. Desaius and other people that works closely with Dr. Desaius. And 2016, I went two more times to the UN. And in that time, my main question was, how do I get to see the President of the United States? Because under the doctrine of political question, that's the only office, the executive office, that could hear anything that had to do with foreign affairs. Uh, basically, it looked like every time I approached somebody from the U.S. Embassy, they run the other way, but uh, they didn't want to really deal with it. So eventually, the relationships, I started developing relationships with um, the people there, and I asked them some questions. And one of the questions I asked was, um, there was a, uh, a report that was submitted to the UN on September 24th, 1959. It's the A4226 report that's part of um, Chapter 73E, which was a, a requirement to, I, I don't want to say decolonize, but so that um, there could be self-governance. And the US was submitting this. Within that report, as I was going through it, I noticed a description of the state of Hawaii did not include any of our islands. And so as I was going through the different descriptions, um, 
I began asking the different um, international attorneys if there, as they would read the description, I'd show them the map with our islands. And I would read the names of our islands and ask them to see if they could find it in the description. When they couldn't find it in the description, I asked them these questions. I said, was there a law in 1959 that allowed one country to take another country without saying what they were taking? And they said, no. I said, is there a law today that allows one country to take another country without saying what they were taking? And they said, no. And I said, okay. As an Arab Kamehameha, who do I sue for taking my inheritance? And I said it as a joke, but I meant it for real. And what, um, when I said that to Alfred Desaias, what he did was put down his cup of tea, throw up his hands, and he said, and that's how you get your kingdom back. And I was like, wait, how? You know? And that's when he started telling me, you know, it's, it's the heirs that have to go and ask for their kingdom because Kamehameha is recognized as the, um, the conqueror. And because nobody has disputed his um, being the conqueror of the kingdom, he is still considered the conqueror of the kingdom and his heirs can ask for their inheritance and demand, not even ask, demand. And so I asked more about how to do that. And I actually came back and I started asking people who um, I thought were Kamehamehas, like, oh, will you please stand with me so we can do this, you know, we can ask for our country back. And um, at the time, uh, people said, well, how about we just stand back and watch what you're doing? <laughs> so, so I wrote a petition and on December 20th of um, 2017, uh, last year, I submitted the petition. And um, actually, Kaulana Bonet stayed up many hours with me trying to get this petition done. You know, it was so hard to do. And basically, it's a 300 page book of history of the fraud and how the Hawaiian Kingdom was taken and all this supporting documentation that many of you that do research, I put those um, pieces of information into the petition to prove what we were saying was not a fairy tale, it was real, and how do we move forward with the help of the Human Rights Council and the Secretary General of the General Assembly. So um, in response of doing this, um, Dr. Desaias said to me, um, you know, if you need recognition, I'd be happy to write you a letter that you could submit to the court. So the memorandum is actually the response to the 300 page petition that we put in. And um, uh, it was a lot more than I thought I was going to get, you know, because at first I just, I was just hoping he would say, okay, you can't do this. Uh, Judge Castanetti and Judge Chang, you know, and, and there are some legal issues. I didn't expect him to get into the depth and the detail that he did. And actually, when I first read it, I was like, wait, am I reading this correctly? You know, and then I thought, no, no, I'm not really, you know. And, and then my friend Claire Apana told me, oh, I think Keanu and Dexter might be able to use this for some of their situations. So I contacted one of my cousins, being a little coy to contact Dexter and, and um, Keanu, and I said, you know, I got this letter, I think it might help, you know? And so within five minutes, Keanu was on the phone saying, is this public? And I go, well, we served it to the judges, and he said, it's public. <laughs> and from then, it's history. You got, that's how you guys know about it, because of their efforts. Um, at first, I just you know was trying to keep this to dealing with um, our case because I really didn't understand the full value of what this letter was. I just thought Dr. Desaias was being quite nice to me and uh, and generous. And uh, then as it's unfolded and everybody's been putting their opinions on here, I've actually learned more myself about how important this letter is or memorandum. And um, so what I believe the significance is and what I learned, not just from the memorandum was, but what I learned 
the thing that I kept stumbling over was the description of the state of Hawaii. I just couldn't get that out of my mind. And I just kept looking at all the different descriptions. The US Title 28, Section 91, which is the jurisdictional description of Hawaii. Uh, the Public Law 86-3, which is the description that the United States put into the Admissions Act saying what the state of Hawaii is and where the state of Hawaii is. And, um, and then again, and the, the Chapter 73E uh, report, A4226, that used the Public Law 86-3 description. And over and over again, as I'm looking at this, I'm going, our islands aren't part of this. And so because of that, I can stand so sure in a courtroom and say, you don't have jurisdiction over me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's not my imagination or me reaching over. I keep saying to them, this is your descriptions telling you that, or telling me and everybody else, you don't have jurisdiction over me. The thing is, they don't read their own writings. You know, the judge didn't seem to understand this, you know, as, until we put it in. On Monday, when we were speaking with the Attorney General, Russell Suzuki, he was saying, well, I'll have to look into that. I go, don't worry, I already sent it to you. I got the card back saying that your office received it. You know, so we have been putting everybody on notice that, um, you know, and giving them all their own paperwork all their own descriptions and basically asking them, so how do you have jurisdiction over us? And why do I have to follow your laws? And why aren't you following our laws? Which under the laws of occupation say that um, we are, uh, you have to use our laws. And some people don't agree that we're under the laws of occupation. And I never really used those words before, but in Dr. Desaius's memorandum, he says we're under a strange form of occupation. And since he's the expert, and I'm not, I'm gonna have to defer to his intelligence and his knowledge. So um, I'm not, I didn't go to school for law. I didn't, uh, I went to school for fashion design. And uh, I have only an AA, you know, so that's all they gave way back then when I was going to school. And, but I did like political science and economics a lot. So, um, but as I was going through, I'm just seeing, you know, we have all been derailed into believing uh, to look at words. And even though we, our intelligence is saying, it's saying that we don't, uh, the state of Hawaii isn't here. They're convincing us that we're reading it wrong. And I think we need to really stand on, these are your words. This isn't our words. This is your definitions. And just know it and stand on it and not um, divert from the, um, the knowledge that we know. We, we are intelligent people. The one thing that I found is the, some of the most intelligent people I have met have been the Kanaka Ma'ole. They're ingenious. They, they're, they can see through in, in layers uh, and in depth of, you know, we're told one thing, you know, this is the education we get in the U.S. public system, even in the private system, it's up here. But we have been trained through our DNA to look deeper and go into layers and depth and and we are the depth of our ancestors. And we carry forward all of our knowledge. And I think all we have to do now is start trusting that. And stop believing what outsiders are telling us of who we are and, and continue down the road of who we really are. And I trust that you know every single person, when I see what your kuleana are and, and what you're contributing, to us getting back to the truth and getting back to governing our kingdom. I'm so proud to be Kanaka Ma'ole. I'm so proud to be and stand with all of you and all the things that you do. I, I can't even express how proud I am. And when I go to the UN and I, I look at some of the things that they're doing over there, 
They're trying to get universal human rights today for people that don't even touch what, what we accomplished in 1839. When they talk about what they're trying to get, human rights for people today, and we show what our king did in 1839 for us, we are so progressive. And you know, it makes me so proud and, and honored that we had that kind of knowledge and leadership and love. And really, that's what makes our culture so different from everybody else, is it's really based in love and ohana. And when we start going in different directions, we're just forgetting who we are and how to love each other. You know, because really, every single one of us, when I see and talk to each person, I'm just so impressed. You know, like I see people holding signs and fighting that our people in the next election will be in the positions to guide us through. We're not gonna turn this over overnight, but if we have people willing to stand right now to make sure as we transition, our people are in place, that's a big step. And so I support everybody and what they're doing even though I personally won't vote because that's my stand. I'm saying you can't, you can't legislate me with, your, with the U.S. laws. You know, so it's a stand that I'm taking, but I do honor what everybody else, is, you know, the step that they feel like they have to take. So in that, thank you again for coming and thank you for letting me be part of this. Sure, we really appreciate you being here. Ruth will be speaking in this very hall on Saturday from 6 to 9, 6 to 9 p.m. So if you would like to listen further to the things that she has to share, we would encourage all of you to return, is it this Saturday? Saturday. This Saturday from 6 to 9 p.m. So um, Kellen had put in the back this paper here, which are, which are the different definitions that I found with the um, map of the Hawaiian archipelago so you can see what it was that I was sharing with the people at the UN when I was asking them um, if it was, uh, how could they basically say that the state of Hawaii was here. So here's their definitions, they're in the back and you can take it home and study it. Thank you again Ruth. Um, and Ruth, I wanna thank you for coming this past Monday. Um, I wanna give a special shout out to a representative Cedric Gates and his brother Benjamin for setting up the, the appointment that we had an opportunity to sit down with the Attorney General, where Ruth, together with Leon, were able to sit down and ask him point blank a lot of the questions that really need, needed to be expressed to him. And I really appreciate our representative and our board member for making that possible. Mahalo. And for no further ado, Uncle Leon. <coughs> Aloha. <laughs> Aloha i a mai o kou, a e maluhi a hoi i ke akua, e kou kā kou mākua. Very good to be here in Waianae. Mahalo for inviting me, uh, Ken and Kellen and, and the community, um, to speak about this really important um, uh, memorandum, right? <laughs> Uh, and it's just not just a memorandum because it is something that is uh, historical and it is uh, pivotal to what we're doing. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about Dr. Desaius and, and why this uh, memorandum is so important. Um, I've known Dr. Desaius for about nine years um, and I met him at the United Nations when I was up there in 2009 to um, to follow up on a petition that had been um, originated by some of our, our people here from uh, Kikuni Blaisdell and Mililani Trask, Kaiopua Fife, and a number of other people who had actually put a petition into the UN. Actually, it wasn't a petition. It was what is called a shadow report. The United States was coming up for a review of, of what it was doing in, in the Human Rights Committee and so um, the United States submitted a report and the, our patriots here submitted a shadow report, which was basically a response to the, 
to the, the stuff that the United States was leaving out conveniently <laughs> about our situation. So they uh, submitted a shadow report in 2006 to the Human Rights Committee. In 2008, the, that shadow report, as well as a uh, petition, was submitted to another committee called the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And um, so the Human Rights Committee turned it over to the, this other, the third, the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The, the committee got this, this report and didn't know what to do with it because to them it was too provocative uh, to take up. They did not want to uh, challenge the United States and particularly since technically it didn't have to do with racial discrimination. So they decided to pass on it. Dr. Desaias told them um, that uh, they couldn't pass on it because they actually have an obligation as a treaty body of the United Nations that had, ob had an obligation that if they received a communication or a request from a party that, that they accepted, um, they had an obligation to either uh, review that or pass it on to the proper committee to, over, to oversee that. So the, the third committee was in a very awkward place. So when this actually came up before the third committee and, and they decided to, um, to uh, let's see, actually they were having another hearing where the United States was being reviewed. And lo and behold, in, in 2008, the um, representative from Russia on the committee asked a very simple question and he said can you explain to us how the United States acquired the Hawaiian Islands and and he asked a couple of follow-up questions to that and then the representative from Romania asked a couple of questions to that too so I was here in Hawaii Kai Opua Fife was in that room uh, in Geneva when that question was asked I was here in Hawaii, I was in the basement of the Hawaii State Capitol, and Mili Lani Trask runs up to me, she says, call Kaiopua, something big is happening in Geneva. So I called him up, and he said, he explained what had happened, that this question was raised. Now, the, in their particular format, the um, country that's being asked the question has a couple of days to think it over and then reply. So two days later, they come back and, um, the United States goes through its replies to all of the other questions that were asked, but they didn't reply at all to this particular question about Hawaii. And um, so that really was kind of a surprise. So Kayapua said, well, we're gonna wait until the report comes out, the, uh, like the minutes of the meeting, and then we'll see you know, what, what it says there. Well, the minutes of the meeting came out a couple of weeks later, and there was not only no response to the question, the question wasn't even in the report. And so, obviously, somebody pulled some strings and made some little kolohe stuff with the, with the record. And so, Desaias, uh, Dr. Desaias says to us, aha, because he used to be the secretary for the uh, Human Rights Committee, he was that for 23 years. So he knows very well that you cannot fool with the records, or, or if you do fool with the records, that something's wrong. So, so we said, well, well let's for, file a protest. Um, and he said, no, no, let's not do that. I said, let's use that as leverage and, and tell them we know what they did. And, and if um, they wanted to make it good, that they would give us a private hearing about Alaska and Hawaii because uh, the question actually had to do with both Alaska and Hawaii. So, so the next year, 2009, was when I was there, and that was when we met with the committee, the third committee, to ask them to present directly to them what our situation is. Now, over the years, we've begun to understand our situation a lot better. And um, in, in other words, we've learned a lot. And thanks to Dr. Dexter and, and Dr. Keanu Sai, you know, they, they've, actually honed it down to what, what is really going on uh, or what, what our situation really is. So over the years, we've adjusted our, our approaches at the United Nations. 
Uh, so we went from indigenous peoples to uh, this racial discrimination, you know, to um, uh, uh, self-determination and decolonization, all these types of things, all these avenues. And even though it was sort of hit and miss, the, the point is that we were able to bring our case every time in front of somebody at the, at the United Nations, either human rights or, or the decolonization committee or the um, uh, Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and several other bodies. And by doing so, we kept our, our situation alive and we kept making adjustments. We kept saying, well, that's what we said last year, but really, this is what the situation is this year. So in March of 2017, last year, I was on a panel with Dr. Desaius and several other international lawyers, and we were discussing our situation. And in my talk at that time was, uh, was a quote from a guy named Thomas Pynchon. And he said, if you can get them to ask the wrong questions, you don't have to worry about the answers. And it dawned on me that that's what the United States was doing. They kept on getting us to ask the wrong questions. So that, and, then, and of course, we get no answers. So um, once in a while, we get some kind of response. Uh, so Dr. Desaius, uh uh, said at the end of that particular panel discussion, he said, you know, now I understand what's really going on uh, because I too have been asking the wrong questions and which is everybody was asking the wrong questions at that time. So what we're doing is we're narrowing in on what the proper question is, which is the United States is here unlawfully and um, and it is a strange form of occupation because it does not fit the exact um, definition of occupation under international law. It's sort of a, a, a different kind of occupation, but it's an occupation nevertheless. And uh, the United States has been also playing a lot with, with the words and the descriptions and things like that in order to confuse these issues. Um, so, but we're closing in on it. So what we decided um, at the United Nations was that it's very difficult for us to confront the United States directly. It's very few countries are able to, to uh, or willing to confront the United States. So the advice that we've gotten from countries and from others um, is that we need to ask a procedural question because that's a question that can be asked and, and the procedure that we're looking at, the one that occurred under the United Nations uh, ages, under its watch, is statehood. And the report that the United States gave to the, the General Assembly about the plebiscite, which claimed that the Hawaiian people had decided to become part of the United States. And so this is what we're focusing on. We're focusing on um, questioning, sort of like the question that Russia had asked. How did the United States acquire the Hawaiian Islands? This question was also raised by Pakistan in 2015 to the United States. So we have had a few states, uh, member states of the United Nations, willing to raise questions. But now what we're trying to do is get an actual resolution passed uh, by the General Assembly to review the procedures and to review the circumstances of what happened in, um, in Hawaii in 1959 and whether or not the United Nations was fooled into being complicit to a crime that took place in 1959. So um, that, that's kind of where we're at right now. There's, there's a lot more details and there are a lot more people involved. But one of the things that, that I have been doing is building relationships with uh, various countries, with the ambassadors and other representatives of different countries, just getting to know them, getting to hear our story. So at the beginning, most people were very sympathetic and they said, oh, that's, you know, we're really sorry for what happened to you. Uh, let us know how it's going and things like that. Um, you know, too bad. Um, but now they're, they're beginning to say, uh, do you, how do you think we can help you? You know, and so this whole thing has turned now. And so this is why we are, we have come up with this plan um, to actually, this is something they can help. They can ask a procedural question. Uh, and
And we have to have member states of the UN to ask the question. We can't be asked by us or somebody else or a lawyer or something like that. It has to come from member states in order for them to really take it into consideration. And the more states, the better. But all we need is one state to start the ball rolling. And that's what we're working on right now. OK? So, mahalo. And, and by the way, I really am honored to be on this panel with, with all of these distinguished people. So, mahalo for all of your hard work over the years. Ruth, amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Uncle. Um, I forgot to mention that he is the foreign minister of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Correct, Uncle? Thank you. So we'd like to introduce Uncle Poka. He is the reason I'm actually in Waianae. I owe this man tremendous gratitude for the things that he has not only educated myself, but our community over the years. So with no further ado, oh. I have one more, one more thing to add. Remember I was telling you about people asking directly to the United States how the U.S. became, oh, how the U.S. gained um, uh, possession of the United of, of the Hawaiian Islands? Well, Oka had a great experience in 2010, right? We were there, and and he was able to ask the United States that question also, which kind of got them all <laughs> flummoxed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I take you back to 1976. 1976, I graduated from law school at the University of Hawaii School of Law. 1977, I was asked to represent a defendant whose name is Napi Pulafa. And when I represented him, I explained that had I been the defendant, I would represent him on the basis that the American courts had no jurisdiction over Hawaiian nationals. And he said, brother, that's the defense that I want to take. I won't go through the long details of that case, but that was the longest case in Hawaii's history up to that point, a criminal case, in which we denied the jurisdiction of the United States over our Hawaiian citizens. Now, we won that case not on the basis of lack of jurisdiction, but because they had a fine attorney representing this guy. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't bring up the evidence that they thought they had in the bag. But what we did was use that case not to speak to the judge or to the jury, but to use that and the momentum that that case would have to speak to our people to use a court system as an educational basis so that people would start asking the question, what are you talking about when you say that President Cleveland said that we stole the country and then this, this, and that? Because what I did was take the time to read Cleveland's address to the United States Congress into the, the court records. A year or two later, or even before that, I got caught up with some PAPL with the federal judge when I said I refused to sign a form that I was to serve on the jury because I'm not a US citizen. He threatened to take my license away. But it's not the fact that these things occurred, but we were able to use it to continually educate. Because why? We broke. We have no money. We cannot publicize. We can go not go on TV, but what we did was use the stuff that they were throwing at us and spun it around to use it as an educational basis. Then I received a telephone call by a guy. He tells me, brother, you don't know who I am. My name is Walter, Walter Paolo. And I'm living down Sand Sand Island, and they're going to kick us out pretty soon. And I want to know, what you talking about when uh, President Cleveland said that we essentially stole Hawaii and that we are not citizens of the United States? So when I went down to Sand Island, it was another educational <coughs> basis. So we fought the Sand Island case and they eventually dropped the case. They refused to give us a jury trial. And then we had cases when they arrested our folks at Makua, and many of you may remember the cases we had when Hurricane Eva hit. And we had cases all along this coastline of people who were without homes. And we represented them on the basis that they had no jurisdiction over us. 
And most of the cases we won, and those that we did not win well enough to the Supreme Court, and we fought them at the Supreme Court. But the point was that we used the education provision of the court to teach people what was happening. We we're not learning it in the schools. And yet one judge here in Waianae told me after I brought the motion to dismiss the case against our Makua folks because they cannot show, the state cannot show that they own Makua. And after that he denies my motion and he, he calls a recess and he says, Mr. Burgess, at that time my name was Burgess, right? <laughs> Mr. Burgess, I don't know why you bring these motions to the court. You're just wasting our time because you know that if I find in your favor, they're going to appeal the case, they're going to take it up to the Supreme Court, and I'm going to get overturned anyway. So I tell him, hey, don't come crying on my shoulders because you're afraid to take your responsibility when you put on that judge's cloak. <laughs> but the thing is, what we find is that we come up with all the proofs that we want using their own history, using American documents. I avoid the writings of Queen Lilio Kalani, not because they're not accurate, but because I know that they will accuse us of manipulating her words. But when you use the President of the United States, what can they say? Absolutely nothing. And then after that, in 1993, they come out with a grand confession. They call it the apology resolution. Heck, more than that, it was a confession of the fact that they stole. So, the thing is, well, what I'm trying to show is that on one basis, what we need is the movement of the people themselves to carry on the nation. It's not a lawyer who can do it for you. It's not a, uh, some defendants who got arrested because of this, this, and that, or any other case. But the people themselves need to arise and call out for the sovereignty. After a period of time, and I, I then ran for uh, Office of Foreign Affairs, I got elected, and then I decided to use that office as a jumping step to bring the matter before an international arena. And so I got involved in regional organizations with indigenous people, then I ended up representing the World Council of Indigenous People before the United Nations. I became eventually the expert on indigenous people before the International Labor Organization and worked inside the guts of that organization to try to bring news of what was happening in Hawaii. And at that time, I remember this guy from Cuba, one of the experts on the indigenous council. He comes running up to me and he says, is it true, is it true? The Americans actually apologized. Look at the, the apology resolution. He says, it's fantastic. Things occur, things that are fantastic, but nothing going to happen unless we press from Hawaii. We get in touch with our legislators. We get in touch with our neighborhood boards. And we have a, a resounding call out for our sovereignty and begin that motion, begin that movement. Nobody can give us our nation back. The United Nations can give us nothing. All it can make is declarations, and you can have opinions by Alfred Desaius and others who say, yeah, you folks are right. But until we gather together, only then we will be able to move. You know, there's two kupuna who had some wise sayings. Sometimes we don't like haoles, right? But they were haole kupuna. His name was Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> And he says a nation cannot stand divided. And yet we look at ourselves, and I will be critical to our own people. On the one hand, we have people who want independence immediately, and they will not talk to the other brother who says, but I need federal recognition because I don't want them to take, take over my Hawaiian homes. I need whatever OHA is providing us, etc., etc. Then once I say, hey, you know good, no talk to me, that kind of, we, we gotta stop that. We are a nation, we can disagree, but we are a nation. So what do we need? We need here in Hawaii to change our own system of working with one another. 
we have to enter into that transitional stage in which we say, okay, all that PDK are all power. We respect one another, even to the extent that we can disagree with one another, but we're part of the same nation. One last and final point. I have worked with many experts in many different fields. But be careful. And Tipi Lahi would say, hey, oy, watch out. Because if you step into somebody else's field, you will end up being the pua'a. You don't want to be the sacrifice, right? <laughs> I respect Alfred Desais. I know him personally. We traveled together to Alaska. We addressed Alaskans. We talked about the issue of statehood and the violations that occurred during that process. How they cheated us. They committed fraud. I'm not going to get into that detail. But one of the things that I'm concerned about, and I mention it now, not to create dissension, but to just call it out for what I believe needs to be called out. The nation of Hawaii cannot depend on the descendants of Kamehameha. The nation changed. There was his son who came about and wrote up a written constitution. First started out with the oral constitution. And what was his oral constitution, Kamehameha's constitution? One word, Pono. That's all that needed to be said on his deathbed. That's what he said. <coughs> okay, my time almost up. <laughs> Pono. Then 1839, the Lua Ehu constitution, written by his son, Kawiki Awaoli, Kamehameha III, talking about what is Pono interpreted now in different circumstances. Today, we still have that basic constitution, that is our constitution. That is what the nation stands for, and every one of us, Haole, Hawaiian, Portuguese, Filipino, Japanese, whatever it is, as long as we are Hawaiian nationals, that is our nation. And we have to recognize, and we cannot just leave it to the the lineal descendants of Paya Kamehameha. We all responsible. That is how the band of history turned so that it moved from an elitist community, an elitist society, to an egalitarian society. So that you don't have to be a Lee of the Niao Pio class in order to be respected in the nation, but every one of us. That was where the bend was occurring. That is why Lilio Cullen said, the voice of the people is a, is a voice of God. And that is a voice I should be listening to. Now it's fine when an expert from the United Nations reading through that history says, ah, a descendant of Kamehameha, there you go, there's your nation. But he is not necessarily the one who understands. We ourselves need to play our role, our part, in the understanding and the discretion of these matters. My time is up. I want to thank you all for that. Thank you very much, Uncle Papa. He helped me understand that even being Kepini, I have Kuliana to our nation. And the more I learned about our nation, the more I realized that our Ali'i, the descendants of Kamehameha's family, were beloved. They sacrificed. They loved us. And we <coughs> loved them. It wasn't like the way we see American, you know, rich people, not care about the regular people. I couldn't believe the way everybody wanted to love Queen Lilukalani. Wherever she went, they were so happy. And the party, you know, and she made sure that everyone was taken care of. And her trust to this day does just that. It's just amazing how this aloha passes down through generations, even to us. Yeah? The people that aren't even related to her have been blessed because of the Kanaka Maoli here. So introducing one of those relatives, I want to introduce Auntie Kibikina.
Aloha ke a kua e puma ka ia oe. Aloha ke a kua e puma ka ia oe is the kingdom of Hawaii. The United States put God in the Ninth Circuit and took God out of their laws. So when you understand what Aloha ke a kua e puma ka ia oe is, that's us. We are the descendants. We are a God-fearing kingdom. And because we believe in Aloha Ke Akua, it unites us. Not the US laws that, that put God in the Ninth Circuit and took it out of the laws. It united all our kulianas. It united every apua'a. Everything is here is because of Aloha Ke Akua. I'm here to briefly explain. I'm also very honored. I'm honored that Ruth went to all this trouble and I've, I've executed 10 briefs since I've seen you, Ruth, using your papers. And I want you to understand the hard work that Ruth and behind the scenes, this, this man, <laughs> Ruth and Leon Sue. Leon Sue's been working way since the beginning of 2000 and before. I mean, I was able to share time with him in Washington and, and we did stop the Akaka Bill, but it's beyond that. This man has given his life to our people. I'm only here to explain we're here because of Aloha Keokua, and nothing is going to work unless we go in that direction. And we are that kingdom. We're the kingdom of Aloha Keokua. And I just want to put that first, because when you, when you go that way, guess what? It comes your way. He decrees it in his name. I'm here to show you a treaty of 1850. And this treaty has, was ratified by the United States by Zachary Taylor. And it, what's amazing about this treaty, because of the US Constitution that's hold, is holding us to the occupation of their laws, this illustrious treaty of, ratified in 1850 both by King Kamehameha III, and also by President Zachary Taylor. The US Constitution is under Article 6, Clause 2. What is that? The United States has to what? They have to practice the treaties. This treaty of 1850 is encapsulated in Article 4, Section 4 of the US Constitution, which was a republic, which is what the United States guarantees all American citizens and occupied us. In doing so, this is the trump card. No pun intended. <laughs> but I, I want you to know, because of that man, he is going for the rule of law. So if he's going for the rule of law under occupation, they have to follow this 1850 treaty under Article 6, Clause 2. Because what do they do? They swear an oath under Article 6, Clause 2, and Clause 3 is their oath. Okay, 1897, Queen Liliuokalani presents the Kuwait petition with her, her delegation. And in that petition, which present, it actually prevents the United States from ever taking the Hawaiian Islands, because on page 2 of this petition, this document of I'm not giving you my land, she took back four million acres of land. And the red ribbon is not a red ribbon, it's a lien. It's a legal lien that is in the largest microfish archives in the world. This lien is in College Park, Maryland. I discovered this in 2005 and my first copies were given to Leon Su. I distributed it through every group, every group that, that were going to do their due diligence and get us to this sovereign road, as everyone has explained. The most important thing I want you to understand that there is proof of October 4th, 1988, under President Reagan's proclamation that the state of Hawaii was never annexed. These are papers from Washington, D.C. You can come up and look at them. But they, uh, 20 DOJs and the Assistant Attorney General, Douglas M. Kemick, found uh, through their research 
because President Reagan was trying to extend the territorial seas so that the Russians and the Japanese couldn't come into our waters and overfish. Well, in doing so, they found out that Hawaii was never legally annexed. Uh, you can actually read the opinion right here. Uh, obviously, President Reagan didn't extend the territorial seas. What I'm discussing goes along with Dr. DeZayas' amazing memo. It's not a memo. It is a, docu a certified document sent to the President of the United States, the, sen the Secretary of State, and it went on down and came to Hawaii with the governor on down to the Attorney General, to uh, the judges of land court, um, and then the appeals judge when it went to Castanetti and, and Chang. What it is is a declaration that the Kingdom of Hawaii, as we know that you don't know, was never annexed. Remember that July 7th, 1898? Well, this is 30 years ago, October 4th, 1988, proved it. That's why there are no meets and bounds in the state. That's why Oahu is not in the state. Where is the state of Hawaii? Does anyone know where the state of Hawaii is? Thank you. It's in the 10 mile square of the District of Columbia that five miles of Virginia, five miles of Maryland gave after the Reconstruction Act of 1867. So all I'm telling you, the evidence is here. What my predecessors have discussed is that we already have it. We already have the evidence. And what, is it, what I'm trying to tell you is that we are. We're sovereign in our own lands and we have been. And the United States didn't want you to know this. Because why? You have been free money for every, they can't tax us under the 1907 Hay Convention of um, this Article 28, Article 76 and 77 of 1907. They can't tax us because we're protected persons under this incredible memo. It's, it's stated in the Fourth Geneva Convention of the Occupation under Article 49. Under the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, under Article 28, 49, well actually not 49, but 50 and 53, they can't confiscate, they can't tax or take foreclosure of any of your properties because they're, they're private lands. The United States came in without a treaty and they gave us what? They gave us a joint resolution. So what I want, I have the joint resolution up here from Dr. Williamson Chang. The joint resolution holds no water. This memo, which is not a memo, it's a memorandum of a declaration of who we are. I have all the evidence of who we are. But we need to literally wake up and re-educate ourselves to know that because of this, this blood, they can't tax us, they can't ticket us, they can't do anything with us. What is that old law of, of Kamehameha the First? Mama Loa Kanabai. And what does that mean? That's right, the law of the splintered patol. So we need to wake up. We have it here. I've got all these documents. My cousins are here. I've passed these documents to everybody. They know what's going on, except the treaty. This, this treaty with the gold seal and the red ribbon is a mandate that when you go to court and present this treaty, my people are free. My people are free from taxation. They're free from all the chains and all the money that we have paid off for bankruptcies from. So I just want you to know, also before I get off, I have to, I, I deal with land and land court. And the land patents, the alloidal patents, royal patents of King Kamehameha III are under the Magna Carta of 1215, which is the oldest 13th century common law. And they're passed, all of Waianae are royal patent lands, and they're passed to the heirs and successors. The Kuleana, we have our lands because Kauike Uli divided it a third to our people. But, and that will never move. We have to carpe diem and take what is ours. What I'm saying is that the autolodial titles of King Kamehameha III still remain to this day under the Magna Carta 1215, 
that was proven in court under King Edward I at 1267 or the Quo Wanto that's known as the Curie Empatara that was filed in England to get all the Royal Crown lands back for the English Crown in 1267. Thank you. I actually cut you off a couple minutes early. You still have some time left. Um, the reason is because um, one of your friends would actually like you to read a statement. Um, we invited Professor Williamson Kane tonight, uh, but he was not able to make it, unfortunately. Sorry, he can not say good say. But he did issue a statement, and he would like Ms. Uh, Ms. Kibikina to read it. Um, so here it is. wanted you to read it. <laughs> Dr. Williamson Chang is a dear friend and a compatriot. This man has fought. He's gone to jail. He's, he's represented our people in sovereign lands that put him in jail for $75,000 in 2001, right before 9-11. He's never stopped fighting for us, and I'm a great fan of his. Yes. This is his statement. Aloha. It is a great honor to be asked to speak before this honorable body. Unfortunately, I teach a class on Monday and Wednesday nights. I have also had very strong bond to the people of Owyanai and has been a part of me since my career started. I was a special deputy attorney general under Chief Justice William S. Richardson and defended his decision in Robinson versus Ariyoshi by which he pronounced that water could not be owned but was held as a public trust. I drafted the state water code. I also have a deep affection for Hawaii and the people of our leeward coast for our people Hawaiians native Hawaiians and those who have had their feet in the soil of Hawaii and have had Hawaii heart. I've given many talks and presentations in Hawaii and I love it so and have some of the most memorable in my career. I feel deeply privileged to be asked to make some remarks tonight. I have been asked by your first Vice President, Mr. <laughs> to, uh, to comment on the mem mem memorandum from the United Nations by the independent expert for human rights, Dr. Alfred DeZayas, in the case of Ms. Ruth Bellamy. Ms. Bellamy's case is very significant. I've worked as a legal counsel on part of this case, so Mr. Pokolahnui, the, the case is very significant. It drives, it drives that wrong by the United States is exposed most vulnerable. Ms. Bellamy is asserting that the foreclosure on her property is wrong under international law and the law of human rights part of the international law within the province of the United Nations and also wrong and illegal under United States law. If there is any claim of Native Hawaiians that is clear it cannot be ignored in, in this charge it is the United States and thus the state of Hawaii does not possess legal title to the ceded lands. The name ceded lands is the name given by the United States which are stolen lands of the 1898. The Hawaiians, those lands were the crown lands and the government lands after the overthrow. The crown and government lands were seized by the traitorous provisional government. The provisional government deemed these lands approximately 1.75 million acres of the 4 million acres of lands in the main Hawaiian islands now belonging <laughs> to the provincial government. After the creation of the Republic of Hawaii by the leaders of the overthrow and leaders of the provincial government, these lands were claimed as property of the Republic. On July 7, 1898, the United States claimed that it acquired these lands by means of joint resolution of annexation. This was impossible. The joint resolution, joint resolution was not a treaty between the Republic and the United States. The last of such treaties was rejected by the United States. Thereafter, in the midst of the war with Spain, the United States simply seized Hawaii. Not by treaty, not by consent of the Republic of Hawaii, not by the consent of the people of Hawaii, and not so they have claimed by conquest. The United States claims that it has seized all power over Hawaii by means of unilateral document written by the United States with no cooperation or consent even from the rebel 
Republic of Hawaii. The United States claims that a document written by itself to itself constitutes a deed from owner to buyer to the public lands of Hawaii. This was such an absurdity that the great majority of senators found it impossible to believe. Namely, if the United States, by passing simply an act that Congress could acquire Hawaii, then isn't it true that Hawaii as a nation of equal sovereignty could acquire the United States? This is such absurdity. For the joint resolution has force and effect then every nation could simply acquire others by a simple act of that nation's parliament. Senators rose up in alarm. They bashed the McKinley administration for such a fantastic, illogical, and thus impossible claim. Senator Allen of Nebraska spoke for many, many hours. President, how can, I, how can a joint resolution such as this be operative? What is a joint what is the jurisdiction of Congress? Does it extend over Hawaii? May we anticipate this matter, reach out beyond the sea, assert our authority under a resolution of Congress within the confines of an independent nation? Where is our right? Where is the grant of power to do this? Where do we find it? Some assume to discover that in, in supposition that there has been a, a session. There was no treaty of session which was no truth ever made. Hawaii is, a foreign, is foreign to us and we're foreign to them. We're, we base our jurisdiction upon false desire to be made conclusive in a resolution of which is said cannot be attacked, however groundless it may be. The statement of Senator Allen on July 4th, 1898, Senate Congressional Records, page 6635. For more than a century, the United States has intentionally deceive the Hawaiian people, the people of the United States and the world into believing that it's acquired the Hawaiian Islands. Nothing is far-fetched, so arrogant and so boldly stated. It is sad to say that the joint resolution had no power whatsoever. It did not take the crown lands, it did not take the government lands, it did not take the lands of Pupukea, or <laughs> on which Ms. Bolome lives, and there is no proof. The proof lies in the simple fact that the owners of Pupukea, whether if the state of Hawaii or some private person cannot trace good title back to the day prior to annexation, look it up on the map. Ask any surveyor. Ask the state of Hawaii. Ask the city and county of uh, council of Hawaii and all the counties. None can trace title to public lands before annexation and such a failure a failure to, show, failure to show that the United States received little title by some act of conveyance undermines the title to such lands whether in the United States, the state or private parties. The claim of Ruth Bolome and others like her thus blows apart the world we live in. She has found the answer. The key to the liberation and freedom of the Hawaiian people since annexation Hawaiians have lived under great cloud great deception and a magic greater than any magician. The lands of Hawaii were never taken. They have never become property of the United States. Instead, the United States took our minds, our beliefs, and our trust. The good news is that the land is still alive with the spirit of our ancestors. The land is not a territory of the United States. The bad news is that we have all been led astray, all deceived, driven mad, driven to the poorhouse, diabetes, bad health, health disease, suicide, our despair, when the truth is that the truth shall set you free. This is the next step, the key for the Hawaiian people, all the people from Hawaii to Hawaii Manello, for Hawaiian homesteads, homeless Hawaiians, it is the trust that shall free our brothers and sisters who live in prisons in Arizona and Utah, and that the truth is simple as the day is long. It is time to take back the power to determine our own reality. We have been fooled far too long. We have been betrayed the trust of those ancestors who filed their Kuwait petitions by the thousands. So many of our 90% of Hawaiians from Kapuna to Keiki vowed that annexation would never pass that the proposed treaty would never pass, and they won. They won, the treaty never passed. Instead, the United States played a trick on us, a trick that has lasted 120 years. We owe to them, our ancestors, our future keiki, their keiki, to make right what has been wrong. Each step is a great giant step forward. A prairie fire is started from a small ember. It is time, it is time to educate and be educated.
In absolute humility, I remain your servant, Dr. Williamson Chang. In closing, I have one thing to disclose to you. Uh, in my research, you aren't aware that Sanford B. Dole, when the person was, uh, when Queen Liliuokalani was imprisoned, he crossed off 500 of her royal patents and in, in pen, didn't change the D, crossed off her name and input his. There were 500 of those. In 18, 97, he wrote the Secretary of Interior, Hulk Smith, and asked him what he could do with this dilemma. Hulk Smith very emphatically said, they're clouded titles, give them back. 1897, President McKinley wrote Sanford B. Dole and told him to return those clouded titles. So I want you to know that the United States has been reselling our clouded titles of private lands and made them public, which is, in my opinion, has gone to the Nuremberg Tribunal Charter under Article 6, Section 8 of J, in particular Section 2E of genocide. They've genocided us for 120 years, taking our land, our food, our agriculture, everything from our keikis and our people and, yes, our resources. Mahalo. Hello, Andy. Thank you so much for reading that. I also have a history from my DVD, No Treaty, No Law, No Land. And this was a uh, history. It was a 96-page book. And I had some dear friends, uh, Bushrod and Emmer Meyer. They printed all this for you all tonight. And this is one page. So I, I just want you to know they did this for you so that you could have your history, so you could learn your history. It was a 96 page book and my co said, don't do that. We're not going to read 96 pages. Make one page. So it took me nine months to write it. But this is for you all. Thanks to Bushrod and Emma Myers. I think they're here. But I want to, they, they did all this printing for you all. One page, you can learn your history. Thank you so much. And um, for those of you who would like to see that uh, statement from Professor Williamson Chang, we will make sure to make that available on our neighborhood board Facebook page. Um, so you can check in there and, and, and get a copy of that statement. And if you don't get um, one of these, we can put, put this on, on there as well. Um, how are you guys doing? Everybody's been kind of sitting for a while. So um, some of our panelists uh, were thinking maybe we could take a quick break. We're actually doing good on time. You guys can get up, go use the bathroom, get a refreshment in the back, and then we will reconvene with Mahia Lani. Five minutes, okay? Thank you. I'd like to invite you guys back to your seats and bring your conversations to a close so we can introduce our next panelist. special guest I had the privilege of meeting yesterday um, down at the court when we were um, hoping to uh, witness Ruth's case before it got removed from the calendar. Um, our next guest, about, about 10 years ago, if I have the story right, um, her and uh, some of her people went on to the grounds of Iolani Palace and basically shut the gates and took over and started operating uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom government on the grounds of the Iolani Palace, which was uh, quite, a, quite a fantastic feat. And nobody got arrested that day, right? Is that true? I don't know. No? Maybe that evening? Okay. I don't have the whole story, right? <laughs> but um, a few years ago, she was officially recognized by the state of Hawaii as the head of state of the Hawaiian Kingdom. and have a copy of that letter, uh, Representative Karen Awana um, was able to introduce her down at the, at the legislature. Kalamai Kenneth. Hui la hui. OK, 
Can everybody hear me? Hey, Ohana, can you can you please keep the conversations down and, and give respect to our next panelist? If everybody, you know, can just please come back. Come back down, sit down so that we can give Mahalani Kahana Oi her do did her her do. So please. All right? Ohana? Kikino? All right. Thank you so much. And we're gonna try to end a little bit early so you guys can have time to talk story with our guests too. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Mahealani Kahoi Nui. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, thank Helen for the invitation as well as <laughs> over there. So, um, and overall, I would like to thank the board and thank you for having me sit on this panel with all these distinguished women and men. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I think each of us have something that we can contribute and that's why we're here. And um, each one of them had something special to say. And I'm a really, really good listener. And they had a lot of good things to say. And you know, I, you know, and I thank um, Ruthie for the courage that she took. Maybe about two years ago, she made some calls and we went to the palace and we were there like on a daily basis. And she says, I wanna go ahead and fight against them. I don't know how to do it, but I'm gonna do it. And so she asked the families who was related to Kamehameha to, um, Sign the petition. I think you need 100 people, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, we were, we were there's several other people and myself, and we went ahead because we knew, you know, what she wanted to do and take it beyond the state of Hawaii. Um, but you know, all of this, the foundation of all that she has done, um, Liana has done, Poka has done, Kilikina, and Dexter, and the many more other leaders out there, is based on the Hawaiian Kingdom. It's nothing else but that. For me, um, when it comes to the Hawaiian Kingdom, I needed to pretty much break down who is the United States, and I did. And like I said, in 1974 is when I first saw Leon, it was Terry, Walter Ritty, and uh, uh, what's his name, Helm. <laughs> and that's when I first saw these guys and I just admired them. I went to everybody's meeting, I took notes like crazy. And it now became my own, so I did my own research and everything else, and I discovered that the United States is a corporation, and they were incorporated on February 21st, 1871 in England. So I'm thinking, why would they incorporate outside? Well, easy, because if there's no United States in England, then they can come back over here and act as if they're the constitutional United States government, and they are not. But that's what they have done. For me, um, through all the years of being taught through all the years of teaching people out there, I realized that there's got a time when we gotta take action. And I'm an action type of a person, and we've done many things, as you know, was brought up by um, Helen, that on 2006, we got arrested on the palace. And the reason why is because we had um, some of the Ohana that came from the other islands, and um, we didn't want them to spend money at the hotel, so I had told them, do you guys wanna sleep over the palace? They go, yeah, I said, okay. At 8.30 at night, we went to City Mill, we went ahead and we picked up 10 tents, and oh my gosh, we picked up so many different things. Um, some of them are here today, actually. And the next thing we knew is that there were police that were coming around, and so we locked all the gates, and this was in the evening. Well, they couldn't come in, and you know why they couldn't come in? Even if they were sheriff and they were police, it's because there was the Hawaiian flag that was flying on that palace. In 1990s, John Waihei removed the American flag and he left the Hawaiian flag. And for that reason, they could not even touch the gates. So I had a couple of lieutenants and um, sergeants and they were at the front and they wanted to say, we wanna see a leader. I said, okay, so I said, aloha. I said, how are you folks? Do you need anything? <laughs> they said, well, we wanna know what rights you have. So I gave them the two letters that was written by Karen Awana, recognizing us, Aupuni um, Oko Hawaii Pai Aina, which is the Hawaiian Kingdom government on April 16, 2008, in the 51st day of legislation. I gave it to him, they talked, they all left. They all left, all the police. The sheriffs that surrounded the building, they all left. 
Nobody was there. 2.30 in the morning, I'm sorry, I know he's from here, came Bill Isla. And when Bill Isla came, he was on the outside, and he says, my Alani. And then I say, yes, how are you, Bill? And he goes, they woke me up, my Alani. I'm going, so what's going on? I say, well, the Kupunas are here, and they're sleeping now. We, we just bought these tents like two hours ago, and I'm not going to have them eat. They're going to stay here. And then he says, okay. And then he said, do you want anything? I said, yes, can you open the bathroom doors and make sure there's toilet paper for us? And they did. And he said, on the condition that you let my security go in. I said, that's not going to happen. You cannot come in. You folks have to stay out. And he did. He did. He went ahead. He opened the door. He made sure the toilets were clean in the administration building, which is the first building when you enter. And it was on the right. And I see a lot of the faces that, that was there on that night. And we stood. We stood there. When we went, when we finally went to court, which is the next year on May 21st, we ended up winning. And I'll tell you why we won. We ended up bringing the titles, which is what they call the Royal Patents and the Land Commission Award under the Hawaiian Kingdom. In a Supreme Court in Hawaii, it is called Zimring, Kobayashi versus Zimring. And in there, the Chief Justice, who was William Richardson, had recognized there's five private land titles in Hawaii. Five. He said, Royal Patent, Land Commission Award, Kamehameha Deeds, Royal Patent Grant, and the Land Patent Grant. You see nothing else. And he also says, in here, now mind you, he's a Chief Justice, he said they are cognizant in the court. That means they have to recognize it whether they like it or not. If you go to the HRS, which is pretty much their laws of the state of Hawaii, they will tell you in 172-11 that they recognize the Land Commission Award and the Royal Patents. And they recognize only the original awardee back in 1840s, 50s, 60s, whatever. And it can only inure or pass down to the heirs or their assigns. So you're going to see a lot of things that is very important for your eyes alone as Kanaka. And the reason why I say that is because, uh, let me pull it up. Okay. The Hawaii Revised Statute is the law of the state of Hawaii. And the Sinin County has a call to their law also. And the very first statutory provision is 1-1. It's about the common law of England. At the end of that reading, they're gonna have a citation. The citation means they're gonna reference their source of authority. Well, the source of authority goes something like this, and it's in a code, okay, and the code is this. L, capital L, 1892, comma, C57, comma, SS5. So let me decipher that for you. L1892 is the session laws of the Wine Kingdom of 1892, specifically in no November 25th. C57 is chapter 57, S5 is section 5. So I went to the archives and pulled that guy out. So to validate that, this is kingdom law that the state of Hawaii referenced their source of authority to. Guys, they know the Hawaiian kingdom is here. They are not a government. They are a corporation. And I'm gonna be proving some things to you that this is pretty much brand new. I'm coming from another different place and I just want you to be patient with me so that I can show you, okay? So, this is here, and like I said, L1892, now check this out because you wanna know this because they'll tell you many times, no, we don't recognize her. Yeah, they do. On the very last page of that, it has Queen Iliokalani. She signed the law of this in which they are referencing the source of authority in 1-1. And you know that when you build your house on a rock, it'll stand. But if you build it on sand, what's gonna happen? So if their 1-1 is based on kingdom law, what is it telling everybody here? The kingdom law is here. Everything we do, we do based on kingdom law. I don't work, and I used to work, but I quit on purpose. I don't have no social security, no welfare, no food stamps, no medical care on purpose. And I agree with also Ruthie, because I haven't voted since the very first day. When I made 18, I decided I'm not gonna vote, and I never ever did. I'm 63 right now, and I still don't vote, and I choose not to vote. <laughs> because the kingdom is here. So we can do a lot of talking, and that's good. Well, when you grab onto something that comes from in your now, you gotta move with that. You kinda just let it sit, and then sit, and sit. You gotta take action, and you gotta move forward. So, 
when I go into court, I take this paperwork, and when I show it to the judge, they hate that. And the reason why they hate that is because I'm telling them your source of authority is kingdom law. Here it is, they already know. Who brought her in this courtroom? Don't bring her in this courtroom. Oh. And so they say they'll dismiss my case. But I tell them, no, I don't want it to be dismissed. And they go, I'm giving you what you want. I said, no, I want to vacate. The reason why I asked for a vacate, because they didn't have no standing to have brought me in the court in the first place. One day, three cases all vacate, one time. So when you know who you are, thank you. When you know who you are, you need to go ahead and take what you know about the wine kingdom and move forward. We cannot continue to let the people from the outside, all those from the outside, saying what you have to do or what you're supposed to do. You need to know who you are today. So two things I want to share with you. Number one is your identity. So we hear that we're Native Hawaiian subjects. Great. We hear that we Kanaka Maoli. We hear that we Kanaka Oivi. We hear that we protected persons. And those are all very good. But if you want to be attached to your land, you can only be a Makai Na Na. If there is no Konehiki, only the Makai Na Na. That's a certain classes of people that the king himself, Kauiki Auli, had blessed with because they were the only ones that could have a Lodio title. That means that once they have the Lodio title, they don't have to pay, they don't have to answer to the government at all. Nobody can come in and say, we're gonna adverse possess your land, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna um, condemn your land. They can't do none of that. Unless you know who you are, only then with that identity can you attach yourself to the laws of the land. Because everything is already ours. We never lost anything. Sometimes we listen to so many different people, and I'm talking on outside, I'm not talking about on the inside, because all that we want here is for all of us to move in the same way. We all want to hold them up. That's what we want to do. And we want to really do it together. And I'm gonna be honest, and I, I'm pretty sure we all are being honest up here. We need to move with all of you. We cannot do it alone. It takes everybody here. But we have to know that we want to go into the same direction. So if the kingdom is already here, the state knows it's already here, and I can tell you that we have been on the palace for seven years, and we ran the Hawaiian kingdom government Monday through Friday. We served papers for eviction notice to the mayor, to the governor, everybody else. We served cease and desist, and I got several of my security over here. <coughs> and we've got phone calls saying, can you come down uh, you know, to the, uh, the capital? Sure, going down to the capital, and what happens? Haven't we helped the people? I thought we were helping them. And here, you know, we ship with the money and this and that and so forth. So they're actually begging us, what can we do to help to actually keep their corporate position? When we did a cease and desist, a cease and desist means to stop your corporate, your corporation, the state of Hawaii, the city and county and all of that. I wanted to make one point and I, and, and I need to bring this up. Um, and I'm meaning to attack anybody the city council regulates everything that happens in the city and county. Their attorneys is called the corporation council. As a city council person, you are plundering and pillaging when you charge taxes at the real property tax office. See, what they've done is they've taken the tax map key and they've taken an address and they've clouded over the RPs and the LCAs. So every two, every twice, twice a year, what they do is they will send you a tax assessment. And when you get the tax assessment, it's going to tell you, you have to pay on this address and this tax map fee. Well, what is that? Because underneath that, I see the Royal Patent. I see the Land Commission Award. I see the titles that the Supreme Court Chief Justice said. That has to be recognized. So we're paying money to this entity called the City and County Real Property Tax when we're not supposed to. Did any of you guys watch the forum last night? Yeah. Yeah. You did? There was um, uh, one of the candidates, Rowena Alcana, and for 10 years I've been preaching this. And Rowena Alcana, I, I loved what she did because what she did is she brought up something because there was complaints coming to all about how come we have to pay taxes on Kuliana land? No. So she went ahead and she went to the city council. Do you know that she unanimous, unanimously won in 2005, but Mufi Hanneman wouldn't sign it to 2006. And what was signed is the recognition of the Kuleana Act of 1850. Let me say that again. The city and county 
who goes ahead and regulate the police department and the permitting and the planning and all the other things that they do, they went ahead and they recognized in Honolulu. So all the island people heard about it and they wanted the same, but their city and county didn't want it. So they went ahead and complained to the senators and House of Representatives for the state of Hawaii and they went forward and guess what happened? The state of Hawaii stepped forward and they said, we want to recognize the Kuleana Act of 1850. What did they do? They continued to recognize the Hawaiian kingdom. Guys, they recognized. So when people say they're not recognizing the, the, the Hawaiian kingdom, oh yes they do. You just gotta know how to look. And you know how you do it? You gotta pull it. You gotta pull it, you gotta ask for understanding, you gotta ask for wisdom. But the answer is there. I know it, I've done it, I went down there and I did speak aloha. <laughs> I just come close. And so anyway, um, I spoke to one of the directors at the Real Property Tax Office. And when I spoke to him, he said, okay, so this is the protocol I have. You gotta go Oha, and there's this woman named Myers, I can't remember her first name, and you, Lucy. And then you have to show her your genealogy, and once you do, to connect you to the, the Land Commission Award, then you have to go to, um, once you do that, they're gonna send this template Pala Pala to the Real Property Tax Office. That is a validation. And you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna exempt that property from any taxes. Now they tell you 100 to 300, but you're actually gonna fall under the Kuleana Act of 1850 because you have to prove you're connected to the original awardee of the Land Commission Award or for the Royal Patent. But they have done hundreds of that. And it's still active from 2000, I think, eight or nine, that they continue to do that. So for me, and for the One Kingdom, and for my, all my officers and the heirs that's under the kingdom, we take action to do what we gotta do, whether they like it or not, it doesn't matter. We will be in your faces and we continue to do that. But we love and aloha. Just wow. so that you know. Mahalo. <laughs> so for every Hawaiian here, or I should say more specifically, for every Kanaka Maui that has a birthright and can trace your genealogies to Kuleana lands, the birthright given to you from Keoko himself is available if you wish to you like this. And because this topic is so hot, um, this town hall specifically is going to sponsor another town hall that is going to focus on the desires letter pertaining to specifically land titles. Unfortunately, because many of us in our community didn't even know who Dr. Desires was or what the letter was about or its importance in our community, I'm pretty sure because of this opportunity, that question is passed. Now I think everyone here wants to understand, is what Antis is saying true? Um, so the wonderful part about this is many people sitting on this very same panel have tremendous actual time in court with this particular topic. And we want to introduce everyone back. It, the town hall currently is being scheduled we will be inviting Kemoko Kapu and his two attorneys who have just settled a 15, 14 year law suit on Maui <laughs> where his Kuleana lands was finally adjudicated and respected um, that the false claims of Alexander Baldwin and the land companies there were finally found to be fraudulent. And so we would like to bring this information again into our community and to have it be thoroughly discussed as an encouragement and to give everyone here hope that your birthright is worth tremendous value if you desire to understand it fully. And for this reason also, we wanted to introduce you to this next very famous person and to thank him for appearing because Ke Anusai unfortunately had intended to be here with us this evening, but because of his desire to protect Jen, Jen Ruggles as some of you may have heard a county councilwoman of Puna who unfortunately is being slandered by the media on the Big Island about believing in conspiracy theories or sovereignty movement thingies or whatever, even though she is pronouncing a legal argument to her corporation council on whether or not she is committing war crimes by enacting legislation that would tax the people of Hawaii County, which is a very valid question to ask. Um, I'm proud to introduce to you Dexter Kayama. Mahalo. Um, oh, aloha, my Again, thank you.
thank you very much for inviting me. It's an, really an honor and a pleasure to be here in Waianae. Um, quick question. Um, we've been speaking about Dr. Desaias's letter. Can I assume that everyone has had a chance to read Dr. Desaias's letter in tonight, or most of you have? Yes? Mike, I, oh, Mike, I, I um, Couple of comments. First off, being last in line, the one disadvantage is, is you get to hear all the good mana'o already. And ike. <laughs> so when it comes down to the end, uh, really, quite frankly, there's not a lot much to add, but I will try. Um, first off, um, I, I want to say um, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be on this board. And what this board, and to me, encapsulates, along with my experiences in the community, is that we are all willing to serve our country. Yeah. We are. I mean, um, for, everyone is trying to do their own part. And I think it is that collective effort um, that will get us there. Um, sometimes we may be on different paths, but it is all with the intent to serve. Oftentimes, it is selfless service to the country. And even when there may be a self-interest involved, it is done so with the intent that there is a larger interest behind it as well. So um, that's my experience, and I'm, I'm very honored to be uh, a Hawaiian national with the rest of you. Um, secondly, um, I am um, very much, uh, I have great appreciation for what Ruth did and what Leon has done um, in their communities. I haven't seen the petition, Ruth, so I might ask you at some point if there's an, uh, a PDF or something that I can take a look at, because I'd like to, to see the petition to see whether that is something I can use in the future as well. Um, Leon spoke about something that I think is very important, and that is the relationships that he's been able to build uh, through, his, through his efforts in the United Nations. Um, I, I think that is so very important um, because I do believe that sometimes the opinions of people and sometimes the opinions of country can start to change things. We have a Dr. Desaias who actually is, his opinion in his memo is consistent with what we've been saying all along. So he is an expert in international law and I will agree with that and I will rely on his expertise. But he is saying what we've been saying all along. So he is consistent with what our message has been all this time. Secondly, I think the efforts of Leon to get into committees, to continue to bring these, um, whether it's a procedural vote or whether it's other matters, uh, I am happy to hear that, as Leon said, there's been an evolution on his part as well. And the questions he's asked over a period of time has somewhat changed to reflect our growing knowledge. Because I also think it is so very important that we ask the right question. And we say the right words when we ask those questions as well. And I'm confident that, from what I've heard tonight from Leon, that I think we are at that point where he has been able to tap into his well-earned relations to start to ask those right questions. I believe, for example, it is important that other countries, once they hear the right question, join us in asking those questions of the United States. I do believe that it is important that countries at some point will also stand up and say, we no longer can do business with you, United States, as long as you continue to hold this illegal occupation of Hawaii. It is important that when countries become aware of what the truth is and what the right question is, my experience is oftentimes people, like countries, begin to act. They are compelled to act because of the information they have. We are now, I think, at this table and amongst the community, many of you are compelled to act in one way or the other. I've seen a number of people stand up for Mauna Kea. I've seen them stand up for their island, they're here in, in Waianae, for their water and for their EV. Um, and, it's, and they've incorporated this knowledge that we've, that we've learned over the past 20, 30 years, and that's always been there, but we've rediscovered. And it is in that action that I, I believe we start to not only change what we do, but also change our country's viewers. So I, I'm not myself a person like Leon who's been fortunate to develop these relationships. So my work has really been here, really been in educating, really been in using the courts to set a template so that I can file additional complaints with the, um, the United Nations, with the International Criminal Court, with the International Court of Justice, in the hopes that that information is disseminated to the right parties of the different countries. 
but I would ask now that that I, I mean I would ask Leon to start to work with someone like Dr. Sai and, and talk about collaborating on that relationship and how we can strengthen that relationship between us and those different countries who are in line with us. Um, I am aware of some of the communications between different countries and I am aware that there are countries who agree with our position, our legal position, but have not yet, and this is a bad word, but not have not yet found the interest, I'll say that, the interest to, to step up and take a stand against the United States. Um, but I also do agree that with time and with the information, at some point they will be compelled to act as well. Um, so I just wanted to say that, I also wanted to say again, my focus has been on um, raising the question of the jurisdiction of the courts here in Hawaii. Knowing full well that my arguments would fall flat before their courts. But also understanding with the clients that I've represented that the idea was a larger message. That to show that it, despite giving them and, and uh, giving them an, a chance to do the right thing, we knew that given the information, all of the information they've talked about before, which clearly and undisputedly shows that this is the Hawaiian Kingdom, that they would fail to, and, and again, to do the right thing. So it was with that intention that we decided that that information can, can then be packaged and sent to the international community. And that's what, we've, what I've done with the help of Dr. Sai and the clients that I've represented. And I think, I think all total, uh, I've made uh, over 20 or 30 complaints um, to the international courts and to different countries, uh, apprising them of the status of Hawaii and the fact that their participation in what's going on here is the, in itself a violation of either treaties or international law. So they are complicit, the other countries, when they allow these things to happen. Complaints were filed with the Canadian government, with the Japanese government, about the use of Mauna Kea for the building of a, a telescope without, without negotiating with the right government. Um, again, at this point it has fallen on, flat, on, on deaf ears, but at the same time that information was passed on to the international community. Because again, by denying us that right which is protected, again, under the Geneva and Hague Conventions, they are complicit and they are also participating in the violation of our protected rights. Um, I have been somewhat silent over the last year. Um, I kind of faced my fair share of criticism and, and, and some pelikia with the courts itself. And, and part of it is because I think, for my part, I laid the foundation of what I needed to do. Um, and I think that those who have that information, I already have seen, have begun to take it up themselves. And I don't disagree that it is a lahui thing. Um, uh, there may be instances where we may decide as a people whether it's Sanford, Sanford B. Dole's outright stealing of those lands, whether that's something we, as a Lahui, present a consolidated complaint of the people to the government, and then with the idea of letting them know that that will be filed with the Human Rights Commission Council at the United Nations. It is those kinds of efforts, and maybe there may be other instances that you have, uh, and I do know that there have been destruction of Evie. There have been other kinds of destructions of our kupuna, that I think fall under that same kind of a complaint should you decide to take it up. It is a first a notice to the sitting government, not the proper government, the current sitting government, that what they're doing is a violation of your human rights, protected rights. And letting them know full well that you'll be filing also a complaint with the United Nations Human Rights Council. So that this information, it is, how can I say, we're gonna keep banging on the door with all of us, until at some point, they cannot help but open the door for us. Right now, everyone's kind of reluctant, even the UN at this point is reluctant to act because of the consequences that they might have to face in their relations with the United States. But I think, um, as a Lahui, whether it's your own complaint with your ohana, whether it's a consolidated complaint with the people, um, I think continuing to knock on this door, uh, I believe, I believe, will result in eventually that door being broken wide open. Um, one other thing, um, I think, um, we have to be prepared for 
a continued long haul. That uh, I don't, I may be wrong and I hope I'm wrong. I don't necessarily expect it to happen overnight. As you can see, it's been going on for decades already. This information, this knocking on the door. Um, but as long as we don't get discouraged because it doesn't happen overnight and we continue knocking on that door, I think whether it happens, and I've said this before, I'd like to see it happen in my lifetime, but knowing that I've done what I could and others will do what they can, I'll be satisfied as long as it happens. As long as we do it the right way, that we ask the right questions, that I'm satisfied that we all built on that foundation, which, um, as they say, results in the huli, yeah? Okay, thank you very much, Allah. Okay, we are gonna enter our Q&A session. And uh, before we do that, I would like to invite um, someone up here, uh, Mr. Kiahi Tejong. And I first met him a couple years ago at a Korean National Farming uh, Conference, so he's a, he's a fellow farmer. And um, he's also here to represent Council Member Jen Ruggles. She's very, uh, sorry she couldn't make it tonight. Um, I know she was originally scheduled, but um, Kiahi is very close with Council Member Jen from the Puna District on Hawaii, and he would be happy to answer any questions that you have directed towards um, Council Member Jen Ruggles. And um, so the, okay, so the rules for um, asking questions, we wanna try and keep everybody on time, yeah? So Kaukohu uh, Wahilani and Kamehakaina are gonna be regulating the question session, so um, if you'd like to ask a question, please come up uh, to the left side of the stage and check in with Kamehakaina and um, just let them know what, what your question is going to be and who you're directing it to so they can make the proper um, announcement for who it's going to be for. And um, one minute is, is a limit, okay? So please don't add a lot of comments or go on a um, long tangent. We want to get to everybody's questions. So uh, limit your questions to one minute or less. Okay, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, come up to the left side over here. Aloha, my name is Raylene Pratt and I have just gotten involved um, recently uh, due to uh, foreclosure on my home. So I've been educated really quickly. Uh, I present the question uh, to the whole panel actually. I have three court cases. I have uh, my foreclo foreclosure case with Castanetti. I have a tax case with Judge Chang and I have a case against Honolulu Ford's former owner and finance director. I have collected evidence of the crimes committed against us as a people, and I wanna use myself as a guinea pig to be able to present this to the United Nations to show the fraud that's been committed. I believe that we're slaves under duress and threat. We have securities and bonds that's been registered against our birth certificate, our social security number, our Federal Reserve Bank, anything that has our name on it. My question is, I have all this evidence. How do I send it to the United Nations? Who do I send it to? That's my question. The whole panel, <laughs> whoever has an answer. Anyone wanna take a shot at this one? Um, what, I've, what I've noticed is um, it's very political and we can put in complaints like I did with the petition, but we can't necessarily, because it's political, we can't necessarily ask them to come up with a resolution. By putting in a petition or a complaint, you're just, you're putting it on the record. Um, what I will say is that I have, um, in finding that I've done the petition and I haven't gotten um, any response right now, to me the best response I got was the memorandum. And I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. But I went further. And what I did was I tried to figure out how do I force the hand of the people that put us in this position? Yeah. And what's the position? The position is, in 1959, the General Assembly, through a resolution, 1469, um, 
said to the United States that they recognize that the state of Hawaii is here in the Hawaiian Islands. Even though in the description, it clearly says the state of Hawaii is not here. So I have never argued that there's a state of Hawaii. I've only argued that it's not here. So recently, and what I'm preparing right now is to hold the, um, the General Assembly to the question. You said we should ask the question. I found something that Dr. Desai has pointed out to me. And what it is, is this. It says, under the Declaration on Population Transfer and Implantation of Settlers in the UN document, Article 10, it states, where acts or omissions prohibited in the present declarations are committed, the international community as a whole and individual states are under an obligation, A, not to recognize as legal the situation created by such acts. What's the act? The act is that the that the General Assembly under Resolution 1469 is uh, recognized that the state of Hawaii is here in the Hawaiian Islands. B, in ongoing situations to ensure the immediate session of the act and the reversal of the harmful consequences. And C, not to render aid, assistance or support, financial or otherwise, to the state which has committed or is committing such acts in the maintaining or strengthening of the situation created by such acts. So what that means is we can, under their rules, demand that they reverse 1469, which is telling the whole world that the state of Hawaii is in the Hawaiian Islands. And I believe that's the start of us turning this over and getting our kingdom recognized by the world and that this is not the United States. Anyone else? <laughs> Legally, uh, with uh, Judge Chang and Castanetti, you have to file three cases. You have to write up a full wanto, which is, which is a demand of subject matter jurisdiction. You have to write your second case as diversity of citizenship and total objection to diversity of citizenship because you, you're, you're asking them, do they have an interest? Where is their interest? That's the diversity of citizenship and if they qualify for that. You have to have those three cases in order for you to even succeed in a foreclosure. You have to do your legal work, you have to demand your subject matter jurisdiction, and you have to come in as a Suris Juris, S-U-I, capital J-U-I, uh, J-U-R-I-S. And Suris Juris, your upper and lower case. And you have to file those three cases just to stay in the court, you have the right to demand subject matter jurisdiction and they cannot answer you. Why? You're a living woman. You're not part of the corporation of the 1935 Social Security Act under Section 501, which gave $1.8 million when you were born, and then fiscally, Section 502, that gave a million fiscally each year. So you're not under the 1935 Social Security Act or the 1940 Alien Registration Act known as the Smith Act. So you need to write your quo wanto and your uh, diversity of citizenship in order with complete objection. I have. I've done that. They've ignored it in court. They can't. They, they, they cannot they ignore the Supreme Court states that once subject matter jurisdiction has been demanded under Heifer versus Mello, they violated the ultra vides, which is a violation of Title Code 42, Section 1983. And if you don't have Hepper versus Mello, then you're in problem. You're, you have a problem. Um, <clears throat> I, like you, uh, had not very had, ha have not had very much success in the, in the courts in this state. Um, but that was, of course, understood when I went in. So I'm assuming you provided all that notices, and again, the courts have ignored it, right? Um, I am not surprised that the courts are ignoring it. Because once the court, once the court any court, recognizes it, it throws the whole justice system into upheaval, their own justice system. So they can't do it. But I thought you asked, were asking the question, how can you provide a complaint to the United Nations Human Rights Council? Okay. Um, well, Dr. Desias's letter provides the address. I happen, I happen to have um, a copy of a complaint that was filed. And all I can do is I just have one copy, but I can give that to you to give you kind of a template on what your case might look like and how you might decide to draft your case. Again, I think it's important that you probably include Dr. Desaias's letter as part of your complaint. Um, and if you have any other information concerning um, 
whether it is a wrongful taking of your property, uh, which is a violation of, okay, uh, a violation of the um, Hague and Geneva Convention. So you need to you need to list all of those. But I can give you what might be a template, and you can use that. Um, and then I think it's important that your loss in this court provides you, the reason why you're asking for that remedy is the United Nations Human Rights Council is because you can't get that remedy here. So I, I'll give that to you at the end of the case. At the end of the case. Hello, my Uh You guys never hear my voice yet, but I get two questions for you before you leave. Number one, are you still in your house? Don't leave. Uh, number two, do you have an attorney? Um, not to represent you in court, but there are fine people who understand law over here that I would ask maybe for some assistance in drafting some of these some of these letters back to the, you know, to the court. Um, Personally, I, I don't know why you want to send one complaint to the Human Rights Commission because that's that's all, in my understanding, going to be done through occupational law, which is how I understand it, the mechanism to kind of get us out of this mess because there's everybody involved. And if we go case by case, holy smoke. Um, but that's the best I can come up with. Hey, Ray. <laughs> So we are aware that you your property is on the Royal Patent and Land Commission Award under Haza Liliponi Kalama, correct? So everybody, she's living on private land that has already been recognized in the Supreme Court of the state of Hawaii. So she has standing. So the argument, if I was you when it comes to the point where you can't go nowhere else, take it to the Supreme Court because they already acknowledge that's private land. And in fact, in the, in the Kobayashi versus Zimmerman case, it's gonna reference another case. And that case, Chief Justice um, William Richardson is referring to, is that no rural property tax office can tax any private land. So I think you need to take it to the next place if you need to, because they shouldn't be touching that land. And you know, and like brother said over there, I would not leave it too, and I know you've been there, and you know, you're another bold woman just like Ruth. <laughs> One final comment. Um, Mahia Alani and I, I have a slightly different view on that. I just wanted to let you know. Um, I have always been um, adverse or reluctant to rely on any U.S. or Hawaii state law because to do so is somewhat of an acknowledgement of their authority. So, so you can, I agree with what she said as far as raising the title question, raising um, HRS 1.1, but I would just say you would add a caveat that says as a matter of necessity. The only reason I'm doing this is because you won't follow Hawaiian Kingdom law. You are forcing me to enter into your courts. So as a matter of necessity, it's just a caveat that I'm required to utilize these remedies, which I believe, again, is um, in violation of international law. Uh, wait, hold on. Just in defense of Auntie Mahalani, um, she never acknowledges the authority of the state of Hawaii or of the counties. She simply points out that the HRS is actually based upon kingdom law, which is actually our true authority. So just in her defense. <laughs> Kalamai, one last, no, two last things. Um, personally, I try to focus on practical application. So my concern is her staying in her house, how her family is doing, the well-being overall of, of the situation. Um, Second thing is, I'm aware that she probably acquired that house through one mortgage, and chances are there are title insurance claims that you should file to get the banks to stop asking for those things, and really that's, that's part of that situation. The title insurance guys are supposed to be covering that debt because it should have been made in the first place. Okay, that's the kind of worms that I was talking to you guys about later, that we're going to have another town hall just on that subject alone. Um, because it is a big kind of worms. It will be probably scheduled at the end of November, beginning of December. We will let you know the details as soon as we can obtain them. Okay, we have another question. And this one is for Dexter Kayama. Please state your name. I just had a question about like um, international jurisdiction. Oh, okay. Um, Yamoku Kapu is my first cousin, please. Okay. And
And then this one right here is another Kawawa Nui Mahi cousin. So we get Kuliana land, mom is born and raised on Lanai, and we have Maui family that's talking. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, but I, I tag United Nations in Aotearoa and Mauna Kea stuff like on a weekly basis. So if we get ties to lands, Kuliana lands for, from Hawaiian Kingdom, and I'm Kiowa and Cheyenne, so I know United States has broken over 500 treaties, you know, so we're not fed wreck. We never were. I mean, we're already an independent, independent dev, sovereign nation, just like Switzerland, neutral country. So what if you get Kuliana lands and lands in Aotearoa and Hawaii? And it brings it back to, I mean, these Kawawa Nui cousins and Kaumoku Kapu, they have Kuleana lands that they're fighting for, but we get lands in, in Aotearoa that they are poison bombing. They're still, it's the same poison that they're poisoning Lehua Island in, in Aotearoa. So where does it stop, you know? So what is, what can we do as an independent and sovereign people uniting all the nations together? Really simple question there. <laughs> wait, wait, hey, wait, hold on one second, Ken. He said it was a simple question, and I'm sorry I didn't understand it completely. So if he understands it, maybe he can, oh, okay. Okay, and I, I call him Mike, because I'm not sure I, I totally understood your question. With respect to Aotearoa, if you're talking about Kuliana land and title claims there, um, that is, of course, out of our jurisdiction, right? So it's out of the Hawaii. Well, Again, if it connects because of genealogical ties, then your claim would again be through Aotearoa, probably through the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, because likely you will not get any remedy from the courts in that system as well. So th that's my understanding. So it's difficult for me to speak to that because I'm not sure what the laws and what the status is in Aotearoa. Um, I just can tell you what I know about the status here in Hawaii. Now, with Ke'eo Moku Kapu, Again, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little lost because of your connection to Aotearoa. I'm somewhat, I, again, I cannot speak to what the situation is in Aotearoa. I apologize. I'm not sure if someone else can speak to that. So, yeah. Does anyone else on the panel want to comment? Okay. Um, just a comment for you. Um, the Kuleana Act was very specific, and, um, and the Kuleana Act was actually recognizing the Maka'ainana. The Mahele had nothing to do with the Makainana. The Mahele had to do with the chiefs surrendering their lands to the, to the king himself, the Ali'i Nui. And that was in 1848. When 1850 came, then the Alodia titles could now be given to the Makainana and make their claim in the Ahupua'a that they already had a Royal Patent Land Commission Award. But it was distinctly jurisdictional to the people of our archipelago, our country. Although you're right, we do have connections with all you know, the different um, Polynesian islands, and it, it is true, but <coughs> that law on the Kuliana Act side applies only to our people here. So if, like, you want to talk to them, that's in China. Hi. He's the youngest of the siblings. Yes. So my mom's side is on the mountaintop, mm -hmm. too. So it's from land to the mountain to the sea, right? Yes, actually, um, like for an Ahupua'a, it doesn't just go to the mountain to the shore. It goes up two miles, hit the bottom floor. That's how big the Ahupua'a is. Everybody think it just goes to the shore. No, it'll go up two miles down. And so that's an entire Ahupua'a. I, I hope I help you in some way. Okay, um, I'd like to tell a story of the three Hawaiians. See, because get the Hawaiian, who's the cultural Hawaiian, who may not necessarily be Hawaiian by koko or nationality, who is who their allegiance is pledged to. There's the national Hawaiian, who may not be koko, may not be into the culture, but understands the politics of it. Um, and it means one is right now. 
cultural national. Oh, and then there's the Koko the Hawaiian who now lives in Las Vegas and has no connection to Raina whatsoever. Nothing they know about. And they get combinations of the three. So it's very important to understand what lens we are applying to what. And to apply one cultural lens onto law, kana ifi. So that would be my advice. Start there. What are you really trying to achieve? Is it cultural? Is it uh, genealogical? Or is it political? Legal. Legal, legal, kind of gets sticky, but it's in there someplace. The politics guys make the law. Okay, we have a new question. Hello, I'm Adam Masi. Um, question for Mahalani Kanoi. Earlier she made a claim that the United States is a corporation. I was wondering if, uh, if there's any evidence to back that claim up. Do your best in two minutes, Andy. Okay, first of all, that's my son. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I have a whole library at home, but I think it's, um, first of all, there's the 1871 um, incorporation. And actually, in 1871, they incorporated in England, and they called it United States, District of Columbia, United States of America. But in 1878, they actually declared their first reorganization on the bankruptcy. Now, I, I want you guys to understand this, because in 1993, Representative Congressman um, Trafficant has stated, and I have that Congressional Act, he stated in the act that, that the United States are the largest bankrupt entity in the world, the United States government. And I, I don't know how many of you folks have that, but they're bankrupt, they're broke. 1993, I'm sorry, March 17, 1993, thank you, Vicks. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and it's again telling you that under international, under national law, if you are bankrupt, especially as a government, okay, like so-called United States government, that means you're insolvent. And if you're insolvent, you're broke, you don't even have standing in court. Okay, thank you. So you have a lot of people, in fact, I just wanna say this, if you think each one of you folks, any one of you guys went through bankruptcy? Anybody here? Okay, do you know that you shouldn't have gone to bankruptcy? Because bankruptcy is only for corporations. The reason why they picked on you is because your name is in uppercase. Uppercase is where they whack you on everything. But just to tell you that the United States is a corporation, they are in reorganization under Chapter 11, and it is 100% on the Admiralty Law. If you went to do a liquidation, which is Chapter 7, you're 100% under the law of the land because it's tangible things that you're going to be liquidating. But when you go for reorganization, Chapter 11, which the United States have claimed, they get to still act as the company, and then they can go ahead and work, give some money to the creditor, and give some to themselves, and that's why they continue to exist, because they're under reorganization. So I hope that helped. <laughs> and you will probably hear much more of that later. <laughs> uh, mahalo. Um, could you talk up on Duns and Bradstreet? And how does that um, play? What role does that play with, with the fake state of Hawaii and their fake state agencies? Sorry guys, I don't mean to take up too much of your time. Okay, so uh, nine years ago, I started to look into the United States and started to find out their corporation. Then I started to find out that, why don't to the Republic of California and Republic of Nevada, why is there states of? Because the states of are the subsidiary of the United States of America Corporation. So I'm in-house and I'm checking, I said, no, this cannot be, but we ended up checking and checking. So Don and Bradstreet is kind of like a directory of all the corporations that's in good standing that trades. So they either buy stocks or they sell or whatever and they have what they call a Dunn and Bradstreet number. So, about six years ago, and I started to follow this stuff, we pulled this five out, and you're gonna love this, you're gonna know who's a corporation, and it's a private corporation. Remember, under the government, everything is public. We got the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. They have their own Dunn and Bradstreet number. That means they are private corporation. They have nothing to do with the public government. 
We got the Hawaiian home lands. They are another um, trading company. They're private. Okay, we got one minute. We got the Department of Land and Natural Resources who's harassing all those people. You know, what's her name? Uh, I can't remember her name. Twinkles, right? Twinkles on there. They were asking her, DLNR. They're another trading company. So what am I seeing? They are private. And if they're private, who are they to tell you, you got to do this and you got to do that? We got the Attorney General. We got the State of Hawaii Judiciary and Kapolei at that. I got the public safety, that means there's the sheriffs. All of these companies I'm giving you, as we know them to be, are private companies. So when we had called the Dun & Bradstreet and we had to pay for this, these things are expensive. It costs like $1,000 just for five. It's really expensive. We got the whole of the City and County Police Department. Every one of these guys are private corporations. The State of Hawaii Tax Office, they are private corporations. So what does that mean? Why does the state of corporate, I mean, state of Hawaii tax office is taxing me because you're private, right? I don't have any contract with you. So you, you have to open them up. You have to see them as who they really are. They're wearing a lot of masks. And so you need to know how to shred that mask open and you will find, and it's everywhere. It's all over the, the internet. And every court, every court has one. In fact, we got the land court with Judge Wan Bei Chang. Yeah. I got his, his particular, um, Dun & Bradstreet number. So the Dun & Bradstreet number is telling you that they buy and sell. You can buy stocks from them. They have the ticker symbol on here. So the ticker symbol is where you go to online and if you want to buy shares, you can. If you want to sell shares, if you have shares in, you can sell your shares. They're everywhere. I mean, I can give you more. The governor's office, he has his own trading number. The lieutenant governor, they're like loaded. There's hundreds and hundreds. So just to tell you who they really are around us, so look carefully, people. I mean, everything is already done. It's time for us to hold them all. Let's, just, let's go. Uh, I know I'm a speaker, but I actually have a question for my Helen. My Helen, I have a question for you. No, no, I'm not picking on it because this is interesting. Yeah, so there's, of course, information we all know and don't know, and I don't happen to know much about this stuff. So, for example, you say Judge uh, Chang is incorporated, right? The land court, the land court is incorporated, yes. okay. So help me out. Okay. Tell me the fact that they're incorporated. How do you use that to prevent the judge from issuing any decision? Okay. This is a good question. <laughs> okay, so, so remember I shared that uh, um, the United States incorporated, right? Okay, so they, inco um, so they incorporate all the republics, all the states are subsidiaries. It's kind of like, Hawaiian Electric. Hawaiian Electric is the mother company of all the American Savings Bank. That's all theirs. It's on the Hawaiian Electric. So you look at Hawaiian Electric as every state, okay? So they make money. And I think Ray brought that up, and I think Ruth brought that up, about how they securitize every case, and I kid you not. If you had listened to Ray earlier, and where is she, Ray is over there. She went ahead and she actually got a stockbroker who went ahead and pulled information for us. And she was able to get the bond. The bond they used, they used their bar number. I'm sorry to say it, but they used the bar number of the, um, of the attorney to actually, because they have to bond the case. You see, the Hawaii State Bar is under the American Bar, which is under Lon the London Bar, so that they far they're a foreign entity. So you have to have a notice of appearance when you come in as an attorney because you are not a U.S. citizen. But they're in our land. Is okay. That a public hazard bond? Hi. Is that a public yes. Bond? Yes. That's, the, That's one of them. Been, one of them. Your bar <laughs> card is a public. And you don't even know. Or do you know? I okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I trust him. I, I don't believe he does know. <laughs> good. All right, good. Okay. We're gonna have some other conversation later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mahalo. Hi. About 10 years ago, I, oh, my name is Kaulana Bone, and I'm a Kane, and I have long genealogy, but um, all my allodial title land is on Kauai, some that is in the hands of Mark Zuckerberg. He thinks he owns the beach down there, but anyway, um, I don't know what to do next. 
I see how much it costs for the filings, the stress, the, the courts making rulings on, based on rules, not on laws. I have a family. I have to stay alive to protect them and work. The stress would just kill me. That's why I know I have to have all my I's dotted, all my T's crossed, and I just need to know what am I, what should I do next? All my research is done, but I'm afraid to just go into it. I'm afraid of the stress. Okay, so as far as um, land research and putting in, filing your title, um, uh, claims to your title, what I understand when I read some of the laws was that as heirs we have to first vest into our, um, our interest as heirs. Now, when we're vesting in, we're not vesting in under American law. This is Hawaiian Kingdom law. I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what it is off the top of my head. But under Hawaiian Kingdom law, it said that we had to vest in so that they would know who the owners are. Now, I did that, and what happened was, now in the foreclosure court, when people with warranty deeds are going into foreclosure, I am being um, named. So I just kind of put my names in light, you know, and now they know how to contact me. And that didn't help anything. I mean, it, it helped them to know who one of the heirs are. And so all they do is do rulings against me. They don't even contact me, so they do it by default. Secondly, um, so then I started going a little bit further. Now, how could I um, go one step further? Well, then I started realizing, well, wait a minute. You know, if I'm an heir, maybe I need to start transferring these things into my trust because the courts don't have access to your trust. Now I'm starting to make some progress, you know, by transferring the, my interest into the trust. Now I went down to the, the Bureau of Conveyances and I started looking at how the people that are stealing our land did it. And I just took their verbiage that their attorneys did and I copied that. And so basically they, they just write deeds to themselves and then they write, they transfer it to their families, first their wives, then their children, and they're making this chain of title. When we go to land court, what we're seeing is they're coming in and saying, you know what, we pay taxes and we have a chain of title and nobody disputed it. That's what they're doing. Why can't we do that? Yeah. We're the actual heirs. Yeah. You know, so that's what I would do as far as um, the land title issues. And um, there are more things that we can do as far as going one step further on the international level and I believe that includes um, putting the General Assembly on notice and um, actually, Leon and I have worked on a way to um, demand that the states, uh, the nation states or the member states of the General Assembly, uh, under their own rules, fix the problem, the mistake that they made of associating the Hawaiian Kingdom um, and the, or the Hawaiian Islands with the 50th state. And so we're at the point now where we're ready to deliver this and um, how would, how would you guys think if I told you we're about $40 away from each delivering um, a notice to each member state? Would you be interested in putting $40 down to ask each nation state to um, demand that the, the uh, General Assembly, Gen uh, Secretary General, fix the uh, mistake that they made in 1959? Because I, I believe we're, we're right there. At, um, and it costs, the reason it costs around $40 is because we're sending it by registered mail to each nation state demanding that they fix the mistake. And it's under what's called ergo omnes. And the reason I know this is because this is something Dr. Desaius told me to, um, to look at. Um, ergo omnes is, uh, let's see. It's their obligation to not recognize UN General Assembly resolution or to recognize a mistake and to repair the damages resulting from mistakenly 
conflating the Kingdom of the Hawaiian Islands with the United States Corporation called the State of Hawaii. So that was what we're asking the General Assembly to do and the member nations. And like um, Leon was saying, we have to ask the member nations to bring this up to the general, um, the Secretary General. And there is a process in their rules that says they can have a special session and we can turn this over. And um, now we're just, we have to put about, there's 194, 93 nation states excluding the United States, including. So 192 people, because we're not gonna ask the United States to do this. So 192 nation states is who we're gonna be putting on notice. And um, of course we have to put, it's about 200 by the time we put everybody on notice because we have to do the Secretary General, the Human Rights Commissioner, and other people um, so that they, we can make sure that this gets overturned. But it's the world that is recognizing that the, the state of Hawaii is in the Hawaiian <coughs> Islands. So we need the world through the nation states to change this. And when I spoke to some of the, the international attorneys, they said that we have to find a way to twist their arms, to legally force them to do what's right. And the way we do that is we use ergo omnes and we use the declaration that I read earlier. And this was from the direction of Dr. Desires. Okay, new question? Aloha, Lopaka. First of all, I want to mahalo everybody on the panel for all of your guys' hard work, dedication to the Lahui and to all of us. Uh, second of all, um, mahalo to all the kupunas before all of us that, that set you guys up, set us up to where we are. Um, and I get kind of two questions. One is the human side of the movement, um, and then the other one is more about the law. And so my first question is, um, with regards to the human element, um, we all coming about on reawakening. And there's gonna be more reawakening coming. So if you guys can share a little bit about the psychological trauma and experiences you guys went through and how you guys felt uh, dealt with that, that would really help a lot of us in the healing mode and being able to you know, stand up with strength and hope, yeah? And then on the second part, if on the law side, you know, we get a lot of ob obfuscation with um, you know, uh, our rights. Uh, and a lot of that obfuscation comes with lawsuits that are um, basically aligned within the U.S. jurisdiction. And so a few cases I want to point out is Oha versus Rumsfeld in 2008 and the Makua case. Uh, these two uh, cases are um, the subject matter of lands in Lihue and in Makua, which are crown lands, I believe, and which have been seized by executive order. So my legal question uh, might be more specifically towards you, Dexter, is in reconstituting the legal arguments of those two cases um, and understanding we have to exhaust all legal remedies within the state of Hawaii before we seek international remedies. Um, uh, do you believe that that, um, that possible uh, subject matter, um, litigating our war memorials, which is the foundation of our country, because uh, Kamehameha did stop at Makua before going to Kauai and coming back. And so um, these are the foundations of our country. And so if you can provide some sort of understanding as to uh, the legal avenue and the possible prospects and outcome. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I thought it was kind of everyone can answer this question, yeah? So um, anyway, just, um, I can just briefly tell you about my experiences in the court. Um, when I first walked into the courts with this argument, um, even though I believed it to be entirely true, uh, oftentimes I was kind of ridiculed and there'd be people in the courtroom shaking their heads saying, who's this crazy guy? Uh, even though I had a, a license to practice law. And in fact, uh, even the judges kind of thought that I was crazy for doing this. Um, but um, over the years, persisting with the argument, especially since there was never any opposition to the argument, because they couldn't oppose the argument. So they essentially, the, the other side would rely on the fact that the court would do their job for them. So oftentimes the other side to the argument would present no argument at all. They would just say, uh, we're recognized as the United States and the courts would go along with that. Um, I, I can tell you that 
Um, in one instance, uh, I provided uh, one judge uh, over a thousand pages of documents uh, that included our Hawaiian history, included international law, um, and this judge, to his credit, read most of it. Um, and, and it was after a few years of doing this, he did say that, um, that we're getting closer to educating them. Despite that being said, I know, despite the fact that he's becoming educated, he's never gonna rule in my favor, not here. Um, and I, I knew that to be true. So the best I could do was continue to educate, create a transcript of that education, and again, pass that information on. So for me, that was my, along with my clients that I represented, their agreement that that would be part of our process. If I may, can you speak about the psychological challenges you had when coming about this new awareness? Um, for me, the psychological challenge was um, understanding at first that what I was doing could have some consequences to my own personal career. Um, and, and when speaking with Dr. Sai about this early on, I, I wasn't afraid to say that, you know, it's a little, it can be a little frightening. Um, and he appreciated that. Um, and I said, because it could be attacks on my character, it could be attacks on, attack on my ability to practice law and other things. So I understood that going in. But after, again, once you become aware of all the information, I, again, I was compelled to go forward, e even knowing um, these kinds of fears behind me. Um, and psychologically, um, the more I made these arguments in court and the more I realized that they had no answer to these arguments, it actually bolstered my ability to make these arguments. So it actually, it actually encouraged me. It, it's saying, because once we speak our truth and we know this to be the truth, we, we, uh, we empower ourselves, and it did empower me. So for me, that psychological evolution occurred, so to speak. Uh, I'll give it back to you after I try to answer the question as well. <coughs> for me, and I'm going to speak on the societal basis, there are five stages of decolonization. Stage number one, is the recovery and rediscovery phase. For us in Hawaii, about maybe 40, 50 years ago, for some of us, maybe just 30 years, 20 years ago, we went through a process of not really understanding how we got under the United States. And it takes a period of time, a phase, in which we go through the process of recovery and rediscovery. We understand our history, we understand how this stole, we understand the details, we understand what Cleveland address was all about, what Lily Okalani said, and, and all of those things. That's the first stage. The second stage is what I call the mourning phase. That's a piss off stage. That's when we become very angry, we want to fight, we want to kill. I wanted to explode buildings while I was serving in the US military. Well, that's that second phase. At times, we have people who get stuck in the awfulizing phase. They, don't, they cannot move out of it. And sometimes media will keep them there. Or other people will keep them there by praising them for, for how, how extreme they can be in their language. But you have to pull yourself out of that stage. You have to go through the next stage, which is called the dreaming phase. To talk, talk not only about the difficulties that we face, but we talk about how we're going to gather together and we're going to lift ourselves up to form the nation, not based on historical injustices, but to form the nation to build a better society than we have now. And that is where the dreaming stage comes about. And after that dreaming stage comes the consensus building phase, where people start overcoming their own racism their own disagreements among themselves. And so you start building this consensus, whether or not you call a constitutional convention or how you do it. Over a period of time, we begin to build consensus. One of the areas that we didn't have consensus was that the belief about 30 years ago that only the Poe Hawaii can be Hawaiian nationals. And as we kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it, then we realized that's not true. That's not what our history was about. So you start building in the humanity of what we need to do. That's a consensus building stage. And after that comes an action phase where we unite as a people. And I just had a discussion about how can we find a leader to unite us. And I was saying it's not the leader that we have to depend on, not the individual. 
But all of us must have, must come to the conclusion that this is a cause that we need to arise to. And that is the five stages of decolonization. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, mahalo. Um, I totally agree. And uh, one of, I like the sayings, uh, our, our friend, uh, Kale Koa Kaeo, um, has one of his favorite sayings, and uh, I think he gets it from uh, uh, an activist from South Africa during the uh, apartheid. And he said, the most profound weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So in other words, we cooperate in our own oppression uh, by buying into the, the, uh, the story that we're given and then by, by getting angry about it, getting, you know, these types of things, getting stuck in these uh, early stages of realization. And so the best um, way to get out of that is to move forward move out of that, to get past the anger stage, to get past the, you know, the, the realization. And it's not easy, but it's what we have to do. And so I agree totally. Uh, what in my uh, experiences in, at the UN, and I've been going there for 10 years now, uh, actually over 10 years, 2006, uh, 12 years. Um, and um, <clears throat> what I found is that we're not the only one. We're not the only ones that have been abused or have been wronged or have, have un unjust things occur to us. There are tons and tons of people there who are doing the same thing as we're doing and they're trying to get some kind of form of attention and justice and some kind of action. Um, let me say to you that, and we said earlier, really the Human Rights Council or any of the human rights mechanisms or, or any of the United Nations mechanisms actually can't give us our freedom. We have to build our freedom ourselves. We have to get past the stages of, of anger and things like that, and we have to start visionize, uh, you know, what you're saying, dreaming, the dreaming stage. We have to start to envision who we are, I mean, know who we are, that we actually are free people right now. We're not slaves, we're not, no matter what the U.S. does and is putting us through, we're free people, and we have to behave that way. Because as soon as we start behaving, like like woe is us and, and all that, then we, we conform ourselves into what into their definition of who we are. So we need to break free of that. And but one of the things that I have noticed at the United Nations is that there are many, many countries that have been at this longer than we have, or many uh, situations longer than we have. Some of them, like Western Sahara, has had like something like thirty resolutions by the UN in favor of their independence. And yet they still haven't gotten. They have over 60 countries who recognize them as an independent state, and yet they're still not independent. So it's not an easy task, or, it, or actually, we cannot rely on the United Nations to give us our freedom or to declare our freedom or anything. We can, we can rely on them to open some doors, but we're going to have to walk through those doors. One of the things that, are, that was being asked of me for over a number of years is like, Okay, so we hear you and we see you all the time here, but where are your people? You know, and it reminds me of that old uh, nursery rhyme thing, or here's the church, here's the people, open the church, where are the people? And then, so this is exactly what it said, here's the church, here's the people, open the church, there are the people. Our people have to stand up. This is what Polka has been saying. Earlier. We have to stand up and we have to show ourselves that we are willing to move as a nation and to take to, not not just to, to demand, but to actually just start to live our lives as a law of Okay. Thank you. Eight years ago when I learned that um, the land that my husband and I bought with Swiss francs, gold-backed Swiss francs, um, we didn't own, I went on a journey of trying to find out why not and trying to invoke our title insurance. This created a lot of havoc between my husband and I. And um, he actually gave me an ultimatum. And when I heard the question, I just started crying because it was very hard to follow by the owl. But I knew it was right. And the way I knew it was right was when I was carrying my daughter, I saw the future of the kingdom. 
I knew the kingdom was coming back. I knew it was her generation that was going to govern us. And when I held it for the first time, I heard a whisper in my ear that it was my job to lay down her path. And at that time, I knew nothing about her genealogy, and I was living in California. So I had no reason to believe anything. But I'm going to tell you, it's hard taking a stand. It was so hard watching my husband tell me that I had to sell everything, and I could only come back to Hawaii as a tourist. Because he knew this path that I was taking was going to be hard, and he didn't think that it was necessary for our family to go through this. We had choices that other people didn't have. And yet, I found myself standing at Teddy Burgers saying goodbye to my husband and daughter. But I knew, I knew we are gonna get this now. Yes. I know this is like, just, I really feel by next year, we're gonna see something so different. It's not years away. No. When I'm at the UN and I was listening to what these people are saying, they want to help us. But we have to help them help us yeah. by finding the right laws, which I believe we found. And I do this because I believe with all my heart that it's now. All, all the work that everybody did here, all the work that all of you did, it's laid the foundation. And it's not about courage. I don't even feel like I'm digging and finding courage. All I'm doing is listening and feeling. And I'm, every day I wake up and all night I'm doing paperwork and it doesn't even phase me not to do it. You know, I feel like when I sleep, I'm taking too much time. You know, you're gonna get to that place and most of you are already there. You know, maybe you don't understand completely how to do it, but I'm telling you, we have our ancestors whispering in our ear. They're telling us how to do it. And you've got to trust your na'al. And you've got to trust that everything is right on track. And that everything that we've learned up till now and everything that we're standing for, we don't need to move forward in anger. We need to move forward in love and in unison. So please, you know, everybody, Work in harmony, work together, and know that how important everything that you're doing is to the whole, and that we're getting there very quickly. Thank you. Okay, well, we are running out of time for questions. Please ask them very quickly and direct them to the person. No need to be very quickly. I belong to the China. Aloha, aloha kako. Come on, let's go, Ohana. Aloha kako. Yeah. Yes. I give mahalo to Keakua, yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit tonight. I came all the way from the other side of the island, and I came here, paddle my canoe. But I hear two differences inside here. One, I never hear too much spirituality. The other one, I went here, all this cooperation, ever, politics, yeah, all belong to the politicians. That's why we get in bus up. But I look into this panel and I say, mahalo panel for being here. Because it's been many years since I looked for this panel right here. And I'm gonna tell you tonight why we have a solution. We don't need all that bloody courts out there. We don't need them. If we belong to the Aina, then let's act like people that belong to the Aina. And these people are gonna help us because Kealkua, when you show me a solution, there's a word out there that's called common law court. <laughs> and these people can create the common law court right here for us, for us people. Tomorrow, and teach right? us, all of us can learn a simple, because the common law court comes out of the 10 commandments. Kealkua, okay? Enough of politics. Let's get to it. It's only two elements in this whole life. You're either gonna be good or you're gonna be bad. You're either gonna be black or gonna be white because you put gray and you're lying to us. Okay? It's serious, it's serious because what we're talking over here tonight is serious. So I wanna ask the panel tonight, when can we start this panel? 
it's, it's still, hey, I like that answer. Did somebody else will answer that? Praise the Lord. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep you to that word. But anyway, tomorrow. But I want any, any one of you folks, step it up and talk a little about <coughs> a common law court, a court that belongs to a court. That's what my question is to you folks. Share with us your manao. Because all of us, like go home and we say amen, uh, we like sleep good tonight, right? Yeah. Okay. For how long ago? A second there, let's get the court started. <laughs> Aloha kako. Mahalo to the panel for being here. Uh, my name is Kalai Bolito. I have two questions. Um, the first question, I had heard Ruth saying that the letter, you had put people on notice. And my understanding, I heard you say something about countries that needed to be put on notice. Um, what are the steps that needs to be taken? And what will that process do for us? And two, my understanding is in the letter, it states that we are in a strange form of occupation. And one of the questions I, or one of the things I keep hearing is something called protected person. What does protected person mean? And how do, am I a protected person? And if, if so, how do I put myself in that Status. Okay, I'll first start with protected persons. So under, I believe it's the Geneva Convention 4, um, they talk about the people that are protected during occupation. And um, what I have zeroed in on, we actually um, put on Command Ikana's Facebook the report from a special rapporteur at the United Nations that talks, um, gives a, the, the depth of the definition of a protected person. And I've gone in and I highlighted um, the parts in there that I think pertains to us. And maybe Dexter or um, Uncle Poco could tell, you know, say more on that. But I just follow, followed what it was saying in there. And what I got out of it, and what I'm zeroing in on is, who are the injured parties since the usurpation in 1893? And those injured parties, um, from what I could understand, the, um, the Geneva Convention was putting together a way to protect people that had private property, that um, had entitlements and rights under their own laws, and that they were, um, it was a way to protect them from getting harmed in any disputes or any of the, the occupation uh, events that were going on. So um, what I have been doing is looking at how we can um, identify the people to do that. And on Saturday, um, here again from six to nine, we're gonna go through that in detail, what I found and how I am identifying myself as a protected person and how, um, what are the things that I'm gonna do to uh, file that and put the Secretary of State on notice, the US Secretary of State. Now why did I look at the US Secretary of State? Because when I was looking in um, these rules regarding passports, getting a corrected passport and getting corrected ID and identification of people outside of the US law. Um, there was an actual um, uh, instruction on how to do that. And I, I ran across that purely by accident, but it gave me very distinct steps on how to do it. And so that's what I'm gonna do. And I've actually started the process myself. Uh, on that, and um, I've been waiting for um, for response on that. And it's under um, putting the Secretary of State, the the United uh, this, the United States President's Executive Office, going on down on notice through what's called a notary presentment under the Uniform Commercial Code. And on that process, um, you are giving them um, a chance to dispute your claims. 
So I gave them, I, under the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, I demanded that they produce the Treaty of Annexation between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States, which we know doesn't exist. And then I also asked them to produce the evidence of conveyance of Kamehameha III's private lands to um, the United States prior to the, um, uh, where 1865, January 3rd, 1865, when these lands were made inalienable in Hawaiian Kingdom law. And I wanted to see Kamehameha V's signature on there. Well, we know that doesn't exist because we've got the, the letter from Queen Liliokalani um, taking back the, all of our, the lands. So I've demanded that they produce the, the documents. If they don't produce the documents, I have given them my affidavit um, of airship and my genealogy. And I said, I'm stepping into my claim as an heir. And um, it's for you to recognize it. And I want my, my proper passport and proper ID. And so, and that's what we spoke to the, um, the Attorney General about on Monday as well, is, is this is what we can do now before we deal with any kind of government issues of who's gonna be residing over the government. We can first identify who are the protected persons. And we need the proper identification, the proper travel papers, the proper um, license plates, so that we are no longer harassed and having these laws being on okay guys, we are over time, so we need to end this really quick, I'm so sorry. Last two? Okay, I'm, all right, really quick. This guy's been waiting for a long time, please. Thank you. 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 I'll give him the mic right here, this, this last guy. He's been waiting patiently. Real, hold on. Uncle Sid. Um, I want to try and cover a couple real fast things. Um, so protected persons under the Higgins Geneva Conventions pretty much applies to everybody that's here. Um, what we've been finding out, so in case you guys aren't aware with what General Rose has been doing, she's become the whistleblower for Hawaii County Council. She's actually brought to the table that she's recognizing as an official, as somebody who's within the system, who does law making legislation, blowing the whistle, understanding that, we're con that by legislating she's committing war crimes. So um, she's, she's brought that to the forefront and one of the things she's done is she's also taken the steps forward to start trying to protect protected persons. Um, all of this information is on our website, generalgos.com. Uh, I think I had one question earlier about the rights of, the, the rights of Hawaiians and protected persons and what they all mean. A lot of that information is on there. There's stuff that we're updating daily. Um, two of the things she did was put, she sent letters, certified letters to all 32 judges with the notice, with all of this information, to let them know that foreclosing on people is uh, creating, their, by foreclosing on people, they're engaging in war crimes and colluding with the United States of, uh, of America. And also sent, queen, uh, sent a notice to Queen's, Queen's health system, because by, um, by violating the rights of the original charter and not, not providing the health care we need to Hawaiians, they're going against their own charter. So that's the thing by putting people on notice, hopefully they can understand that they're breaking the law and do the same thing that Jen has done and try and start blowing the whistle because in, once again for me, it comes back to practical application. We need to understand how does this benefit me on a daily life? If this doesn't benefit me daily, you know, we're gonna start thinking about maybe finding other solutions. So it, it has to be a real impact and that's pretty much it. I, I have to make a comment with respect to the question. So she asked the question, how is she a protected person? Let me just tell you, Dr. Desias' letter is, is instructive on that. Okay, he specifically says that a result of this strange occupation. Okay, so the occupants of that occupied land, which is you and me, especially if you can trace your history back to a family member who was a Hawaiian national at the time, you become that protected person. So I just wanted to make that clear. So the clarity is that you need to trace your, as a Hawaiian national? As a Hawaiian national, not Coco. You, not, you don't have to be Coco. You could be a Chinese who can trace their genealogy back to a Chinese ancestor who was a Hawaiian national, and you would have that protected status as well. Okay, 
So I wanted to make that clear. Now, one other thing I want to make clear is that Dr. Isaiah in his letter basically said, and it's in the second paragraph, that I re recommend that the people of the Hawaiian Islands be provided access to UN procedures to protect their protected rights, okay, under international law. Two things about that. One, Dr. Desaias amended his original uh, um, opinion in 2013, where at that time he talked about indigenous people. He changed that from indigenous to people of the Hawaiian Islands because he now is of the opinion that we are occupied. So you have to make that distinction, we are occupied. Okay, and secondly, the Hague and Geneva Conventions only apply to protected persons of occupied countries. So that's why we are occupied. So it's all consistent that we are occupied, and because we're occupied, we have that protected person status. And, and just one other comment. I, I agree with what Puka said as, as far as our recovery, our reawakening, and our reimagining, and our dreaming. I just might say that in, to be in line with Dr. Desaias, and so that we don't confuse ourselves, it's just my own opinion. I would say that this is a process of deoccupation, not decolonization, because those are in a legal sense, very different terms. So that's just my own one on that. One quick clar clarification is that um, if you're a federal employee or a member of the military, it doesn't apply to you. Mahalo. Aloha, ahiai, kako. Alana ke'ia. Mahalo nui loa to all of our panelists. And mahalo nui loa to you, my members in the community far and near. I pledge my allegiance to the Hawaiian Kingdom. I've given service for, I don't know, Poka, how many years ago was that in the old courthouse where he instructed us not to stand for the judge. And even though I work for the court, my makahu, no need be afraid. And what uncle said about Keakua, trust your na'au, and as auntie said about your DNA, we need to help each other activate that. So what I pledge today is how to be a subversive warrior, to work in conjunction with the people that have stepped forward, to stay together, to respect each other, that everyone is everybody's responsibility, respect the culture, yukupuna and keakua. And so I make myself available to my community. Mahalo nui loa. Mahalo nui loa. Okay, I think we have one more. All right. Aloha, my name is Kyopi. I'm from the Big Island. Okay? I want to make one statement to all of us. If you folks remember, when Israel Kamakamuyole died, his funeral was held in the capital. I think some of you remember that. There was someone that got up there and said to everybody, if the Hawaiians ever get together like this, the state of Hawaii is gone. Okay? That's my statement. Get together. I'm from the big island. If you want to get together with me, I leave my number here. With this island here, get together. It doesn't matter where, if you get more Hawaiian than this Hawaiian. This is the melting pot of the Pacific. My question is for Ruth. If the President of the United States declared martial law, where would we stand as the Hawaiian Kingdom and in the international law? Well, if the, if the President of the United States is trying to assert law upon the Hawaiian Kingdom, I would say, can he assert law upon Japan, Germany, Australia? And if the answer is no, then why would we listen? Is it? Are we done? We gotta go! Ah! Hello, my, um, so as I understand it, martial law military government is kind of the same status that we need to get out of this occupation according to the rules of occupation. So it's kind of, I don't know, it's technical terms because martial law and military government, while it's the same thing they operate under, it's got to be the military government doing it, not the martial law. 
So, yeah. Uh, I wanted to make a comment. I saw a video, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he's from Big Island. <laughs> and he was doing, in fact, it was sent to me by Eric. Um, and he was a Navy guy sitting in a meeting, I think with Henry Noah and several other people. And he made mention that um, he was kind of like the second in command on the Obama at that time. And he said that the military is for sale. That if you pay them, they'll do what you want. And I, and I had to rewind and rewind and rewind. I got his last name, but I couldn't figure out his first name, but I know his first name now. So what I'm trying to say is that, which I forgot to tell you guys, is that every military installation from Schofield to you know, um, Fort Shafter to Kaneohe Marine Base, they all have also trading numbers. They're all, they're all private companies themselves. And he said that, and he was in white, and he was the number one guy. And I found out that he's still working, and now he's on the Trump. I think we should hold Trump accountable in a good way. I'm saying this in a good way, because in his campaign, he said, that he was going to give the kingdom back to the Hawaiian people and their laws, he said all that. And you know, I would hold him to his word because he gave, um, if you folks know, Jerusalem back to Israel. And I, I look at the Hawaiian kingdom as being the same thing. And I believe this guy would do that because it's in his campaign. So all we have to do is just, you know, mali mali and a lot of aloha and a lot of love and I think it's going to be done. Amen. Amen. All right, we need to wrap up. Oh my goodness, we, get, we don't have the time, guys. Aloha, family. My name is Nina Kelly Bahamanas Kamai Kaihui. And I was here sent by God because Keokoa, and he gave me a message for all of us. Okay, and this is the scripture that he gave me while I was sitting down. And he said, if my people, which are called by my name, <laughs> shall humble themselves and, I, and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and will I forgive their sin, and will I heal their life. Amen. Mahalo kia ko. Aloha. Aloha kako. Aloha my kitas. Kane. I would like to emphasize what Mahelani Tahanamoy has said. The man is Ren Beaumont. He lives on the island of the Big Island, Hawaii. <coughs> I have indeed talked to this man. Who am I? Kelly Nekahau. We are on furlough. I got that from him. There is a contract. The contract needs to be rewritten. One thing that has been done was a command that needed to go out of the recognition of all people, all lineage, and the Hawaiian Kingdom government. Everything that you have done, all of you here, I applaud you. Because unity is the, is the number one thing. And I'm going to tell you that because Ren Beaumont, I'm sorry you beeping, I know, I'm sorry, but you know what? He said, if we don't unite and get together, they ain't gonna pay attention to nothing. But I do know one thing, they need a contract. And they need it from the rightful government and they need someone to write it. I am full calling federal postal hyphen judge, Kelly Nikahal. I am here for the people. My interest lies in the universe, but my priority is home. Okay? Everybody got that? Unity? Where's my... Sanai, how do you say unity in Hawaiian? Lokahi. Lokahi, thank you. Okay? Sorry, I like, I like how the mic now. Okay. I love you all. God bless you all. I love you, my sister. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. We need to wrap it up. Kaokohu is going to end us with a, a pule. Um, two quick announcements. What's next, right? So Saturday, Ruth is going to be back here from 6 to 9 p.m. right here in this room. Um, also, there's something going on here tomorrow in one of the back meeting rooms. Jean Tamashiro, raise your hand over there. Jean.
Um, he has some flyers they can pass out. They're a circle of sovereigns. They've been doing some great work on the Big Island. So please go talk to Gene afterwards and uh, come here tomorrow, 6.30 to 8.30. Um, Gene is gonna be uh, working with his circle of sovereigns here. Okay, Kaukohu, take us home. Okay, everybody. Aloha hikikai hikikai. Kalaiwa puno yaoko, me holo yaoko. Mai pui na ole yaoko. Ha'ehel, na kanako hivi. I mean, na pui hawaii. Mai pui na ole, kuu mo i wahini lili wakalani, me na tupuna. Eo? E ko mako mako i loko kalani. E hane i ako ino, e hiki mai ko aupune. E malama i ako make make maka hunuane. Elike me ia malama ia makalani la, e haavi mai ia mako i tia la, e aina mako ono ni ia la, e kalamai hoi ia mako ka mako lawe hala ana, me mako e kalani i ka boi i lawe hala i ka mako, mai ho kua ia mako i ka ho vale vale ia mai, e ho pakele no na ia mako ka ino, no ka mea, no ke au kuni, ame ka mana, ame ka ho nani ia maulo aku. Hawa i po no i, hawa i po no i,